Hey, it's 9 a.m. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors uh, board meeting for Tuesday, August 23rd. Today, we will start with a Pledge of Allegiance, as we always do, but Supervisor Wygant will lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, before we start on our uh, consent agenda and public comment, we want to uh, go to item 10A, um, our wonderful treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> is here and she needs to go deal with some bond sales so we want to take her item up first those are very important items for us so Janine will go to 10a on our agenda thank you very much for accommodating that we are having an exciting bond sale for the um, Western Placer Waste Management Authority this morning it's going very very well and I've got to get in there and, uh, when we award bonds so thank you um, before you is a request to adopt a resolution authorizing the Treasurer Tax Collector's Office to offer Diane Handy post-retirement employment prior to the California Public Employees Retirement System, or CalPERS, required 180 days waiting period. Government Code Section 7522.56 requires that uh, CalPERS retirees must complete a 180-day waiting period prior to employment eligibility as a retired annuitant. Um, uh, Diane retired on uh, August 13th, and um, we have been recruiting for that position, um, but it has been a little bit of a protracted um, um, process, and um, we have not been able to fill it, and she has a critical role uh, as chief deputy treasurer with cash management and um, investment and also bonds. And so uh, we need to hire her back on an interim basis. Um, and it, this was unanticipated. We thought we would have this position filled, but we've had some wrinkles. So with that, any questions? Any questions, board members? OK, any public comment on this item? I'm not seeing any in the room. And Megan reports nobody on Zoom. So with that, I'd entertain a motion. And motion Holmes, second Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Janine. Thank you. Have a good day. Sell those bonds. <laughs> At a high price, yes. <laughs> low price, low price. OK. Um, OK, we'll go back to our regular agenda items now with consent agenda. Do any members of the board wish to pull any items off our consent agenda? Okay, I'm going to um, ask that we pull item 23B, and that's our response to the grand jury. And with that, is there any member of the public that would like to have an item pulled from consent? We have or one. comment? Yes? Michael, would you like to pull an item from consent calendar? Thank you, yes. Good morning, Supervisors. Mike Garabedian with Placer County tomorrow to pull item 29B, Placer Vineyards. Transportation fee. Thank you. Are there any other public comments or requests? Not seeing any. I'd entertain a motion to approve the rest of the consent calendar. Motion Wygant. Second Holmes. This is a roll call. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. On 23B, my reason to pull it was um, primarily the, when the grand jury uh, provides us a report, I feel like it should be very transparent to the public. And because it was on consent calendar, I just wanted to get it out in front of the public that we have responded. Um, there was some great insights in the grand jury report. And I also would like to ask staff um, in future years, put the grand jury report and our response in one place in the board packet for the public because we received the grand jury report somewhere else, then we had a response in our packet, but we didn't have them both together. So I think that would be helpful to the public and honor the great work the grand jury does as volunteers. 
Um, they are doing their job, and I want to make sure we acknowledge their hard work and that we're professional in our response to them. So, um, Suzanne, did you want to comment on this? Okay. Any other comments, board members? Um, then I'd move approval of 23. Oh, public comment on this item. Cheryl, Hi, did good, you want to give? Good morning. I'm, I'm sorry I just joined, so I wanted to um, ask that 23B be pulled from consent, please. Cheryl, we already pulled it. We were just discussing it. Oh, um, so Thank go you. ahead and would you like to go ahead and make your comment on 23B? I would. Thank you. So um, first of all, I, I believe that this item is a contentious item and should not have been in um, in the consent area. I think that it's it's pretty clear whenever there's a, a major housing element or the homeless on on the Placer um, Auburn campus, the number of people that have come out is just um, something that's very important to the public. Um, I, I also think that the housing manager has not been present for major housing items such as specific plans. I believe it is their job to advocate um, for residents and the homeless, um, especially in the specific plans, the location for low-income housing. Um, when the housing was realized that it wasn't going to be met, um, there was no plan to adopt anything um, to make up for that. Um, they knew, uh, both, both CEDRA director and the housing manager knew that that plan was not going to be met. In the 2001 to 2000, uh, 2021 to 2029 housing plan, um, the executive summary held a bunch of accomplishments and look at the last page of hundreds of pages of documents to see what our performance was. That's a lack of transparency. It should have said right up front, um, the, there have been independent studies that showed that the uh, housing in Placer County was rated across all counties and Placer County were D's and F's. Um, and instead, the housing um, manager gets promoted to director level. I, I, don't, I don't think that, that sh the performance of employees is commensurate with the performance in housing. There's also been a, um, I believe a pattern of practice by the CDRI director and housing manager to shift responsibility from de developers to residents. They allow extensions and entitlements without ensuring anything has been built. Zero has essentially been built. 20 years from now, it'll all be forgotten and nothing will have ever been built. So there's a lack of accountability there. Um, another is an example of questionable ethics. In Supervisor Wagan's district, with Carvana, there were 950 employees that were low income employees that were going to be um, hired and there's no workforce housing. The housing manager was not there to advocate again, yet a couple months later, HCD mandated and, and the board approved 50 units of workforce housing. So instead of giving the two billionaires from uh, convicted billion felon billionaires from Arizona, the two wealthiest people in Arizona, you gave a gift of housing, free housing that they didn't have to contribute, yet <clears throat> taxpayers had to pay that out of the general fund. And the Sunset Area Plan... Cheryl, Cheryl, your time is up. Can you wrap up, please? Yes, I will. How, the Sunset Area Plan, the housing manager allowed low-income housing to be built bordering the freeway and next to industrial. Um, I think that that speaks to the, the housing manager, again, not advocating. The 21 to, 2021 to 2029 housing element again was changed at the last minute after the board submitted it <clears throat> shifting responsibility from developers to residents i thank the um the uh, grand jury for such a thorough report and i hope that you consider a lot of it seemed very dismissive on the part of the board thank you thank you cheryl for your comments are there any other public comments on this item Okay, um, Supervisor Jones. Yeah, I, I did want to make one comment on the um, responses to the grand jury findings. Um, going through this this part, which is a public document, 
Um, finding seven was missing from the, um, from the letter, the response to the grand jury. And the only reason I bring that up is because we have no way, or the, the public has no way of knowing what finding seven was. I mean, it's not, it's not quoted in here, or, nor is there a response. And I realize that there are uh, one, two, three, four, five um, findings that we agree with, and we addressed four of them, but we left number seven out. So I just think that for the public's purpose, great. You know, they should at least have the title, what the finding was. Great. Thank you. Sure. Karen? And, and I don't disagree with you, um, Supervisor Jones, although I would point out for the record that there was uh, the summary of agreements, uh, partial disagreements and disagreements, uh, summarized at the very uh, start of the letter, and finding seven was included in that summary. Right, right. But what I'm talking about is, you notice on each of these findings, it says what the finding was, and then, of course, there's our response. So since seven's not on here, the public has no way of knowing what this, the finding was. Yeah, and, and, and that is partially why I asked for the grand jury report, their report to be put in the packet with right. our responses so the public can easily go back and forth because of your question on that. I think that's an excellent point. Great. Thank you. That way they can see uh, all, the, all those comments. Um, so not seeing any other public comment or board discussion, um, I'd move approval of 23B. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, then we'll move on to item, I'm sorry, 29, 29B. And do we? Have Good morning, board members and Madam Chair. Yeah, my name is Phil Vashon with the Department of Public Works. This is my item. Happy to answer any questions. Um, this was pulled by a member of the public, so um, we'll ask Mr. Garabedian to provide his comments, unless their board members have any questions. Mr. Garabedian, go ahead and provide your comments. Uh, thank you. Mike Garabedian for Placer County Tomorrow. Um, I'm looking for some explanation and uh, understanding here. Um, the uh, general explanation of the process here. And then I have three uh, questions. The, the basis uh, for the $1.31 million amount um, and the amount in the fund now and um, if there's expected uh, later traffic fee agreements in the future. Uh, those are my inquiries without further comment to make. Thank you, Mr. Garabedian. Do you want to address that, Phil? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so, Mr. Garabedian, so this is a traffic fee reimbursement agreement for the uh, Placer Vineyards Property 1A project. Um, so, as part of the conditions of approval for their project, they were to uh, widen Willerga Road from two to four lanes. Uh, you know, in their project vicinity and also build a new signal at Willerga Road and Town Center Avenue. We have money in our uh, Dry Creek CIP uh, capital improvement program for those improvements. And it is our responsibility to check and make sure that uh, their final invoicing and final billing for the, the project does not exceed what we have in our CIP for those limits, for those improvements. Uh, the 1.31 million is a not to exceed amount that we have identified that is currently within our Placer County Dry Creek CIP. Um, so that's, that's where that comes from. And that was, uh, you know, checked by myself, uh, just doing a ratio to see how much is uh, available within our Dry Creek CIP. Um, the other, uh, I would have to say that there will be probably additional agreements in the future for additional improvements for future Placer Vineyards improvements. Uh, we will address those at those times that they come in. Um, but this is uh, to address specifically uh, the improvements on Willerga Road, uh, you know, in. Uh, in that project area and uh, and the signal at Town Center Avenue. 
I think you had one other question. I don't recall what it was. Thank you. I appreciate the response. Any further follow-up from the board? I'd entertain a motion. I'll move approval of the item. Second. Supervisor Gore and Holmes. Is this a roll call, Megan, or? No. Okay. No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Well, it's our great pleasure to have uh, Congressman Tom McClintock with us now. We're going to start this item off um, with a commendation that the board, it's okay, I've already checked. We're five minutes early, but we wanted to make sure we uh, don't start um, and delay the Congressman's valuable time. Um, we have a commendation for you, sir, and I'm going to read that and then entertain uh, comments from my fellow colleagues here uh, on your um, your assistance here. So I will start with the um, commendation that doesn't begin to capture everything, Congressman. In the matter of a commendation recognizing Congressman Tom McClintock for his 14 years of service representing the citizens of Placer County. Whereas Tom McClintock was born in White Plains, New York and graduated in 1978 from the University of California, Los Angeles. At 23, he was elected chair of the Ventura County Republican Party and served until 1981. And whereas prior to his election to Congress, Tom McClintock served 14 years as a California State Assemblyman and eight years as a California State Senator. And whereas Tom McClintock first assumed office representing the people of the 4th District of California on January 3rd, 2009, and whereas Congressman McClintock has become a national leader on forest management efforts to reduce catastrophic wildfire. And whereas Congressman McClintock's forest management legislation has proved instrumental in protecting and preserving Lake Tahoe for future generations. And whereas Congressman McClintock serves as a member of the House Budget Committee, as well as a member of the House Judiciary Committee, where he serves as ranking member of the Subcommittee on Immigration and Citizenship, and also serves on the Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties. And whereas Congressman McClintock is a senior member of the House Natural Resources Committee, where he serves on the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands, which he chaired from 2015 to 2018, and on the Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife, which he chaired from 2011 to 2015. And whereas Placer County is grateful to have worked with Congressman McClintock to address important issues, including water, agriculture, regulation, energy, forest health, etc. And whereas Placer County commends Congressman Tom McClintock for his dedication and leadership on behalf of the residents of Placer County. Now, therefore, let it be known that the above commendation was duly passed by the Board of Supervisors on behalf of the citizens of Placer County at a regular meeting held August 23, 2022, recognizing Congressman Tom McClintock for his exceptional service to the people of Placer County. Um, let's get. To, uh, Let's take comments from the board. And I see Supervisor Gore is first. Thank you, Chair Gustafson. Good morning, Congressman McClintock. It is wonderful to have you here today. And um, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to you um, for representing this area for so many years. Um, and I wish you all the best as you move on to the, the next con congressional district. But really, you and your team have always been so very responsive whenever I have questions or whenever there are constituent issues that come up, they've done a great job of responding to the needs of our residents. And then um, you are a student of history, and I have to tell you that every time you would speak and share, um, share something, I always learned something new about um, our history as a country, um, about our founding fathers. And so whenever you speak, I always walk away feeling very inspired um, about our country and who we are and who we are really called to be um, as a country. So thank you so much for all of your years of service. I know there's more to come, but it is, um, I just really appreciate what you've done for our community. Supervisor Holmes. Congressman, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you for being here. You have served, um, you know, in the State Assembly, the State Senate, and now United States Congress. 
and you have served with the highest degree of integrity, and you have never wavered from your core values, and that means so much to us, and we admire you and appreciate your, your approach to governance and the work you've done for our, our citizens throughout the state of California and the United States. So congratulations. I know you will continue uh, in your new district, and uh, we'll be keeping an eye out for you. Thank you, sir. Supervisor Wygant. Congressman, uh, first of all, I want to set aside the issue with USC versus UCLA so we can get that behind us and, and look forward. Uh, but um, I want to thank you personally. Uh, most for the public, I don't think um, most in the public would understand that at the local level, we have a rich opportunity to work closely with our congressmen. And in your district, I've worked closely with your predecessor, John Doolittle, and with you. And I want to personally thank you, especially for one of my highest priorities, the support with a conservation plan. And as I leave and the rest of you stay, I think there's really rich opportunity for dealing with things like forest management, working together, Hillsdale, hopefully. Uh, so again, thank you and um, good luck with your work in the future. Thank you. And Supervisor Jones. Hi, Congressman. This is it. We, go, we go way back to about 2008. And I want to say that I have a great deal of respect for you because you've always adhered to your principles through thick and through thin and you have served us with great distinction and honor. Placer County is gonna miss you and your representation, and I'm gonna miss you, especially miss you all from being my co-office mates across the hall from my office. <laughs> so, luck I don't think you'll need, but I wish you the best of everything in your new district. Congratulations to you. Great, and finally, um, it's great to have my colleagues go first because they've said all the great things. I wrote down unwavering principles and convictions, and you are certainly a man of integrity. You've stood by those and representing us and representing this country, um, and incredible staff, phenomenal staff. We all really enjoy working with your staff, and how hard you fought for us to Bring common sense to federal government when we most needed it at the local level. So thank you for that. Um, and it's great to know we're going to have a friend in another office in Congress. Um, I know we won't be far away, and you'll continue to be a great and strong advocate for our community and our constituents. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's now time for me to ask the public if you have any comments on this item. And not seeing any, we'd love to have a photo with you, Wait, Congressman. You. All of us. Oh, we <laughs> didn't take a motion. Can I'll I? Have approval of the item. Okay, <laughs> Supervisor Gorin Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Okay, uh, then we'll move on on our items um, to public comment. This is an opportunity for those of you who'd like to speak to us on an item not on today's agenda. Please uh, limit your comments to three minutes. And uh, if we run out of time, we'll uh, take up more public comments at the end of the meeting. Richard, good morning and welcome. I'm Richard, a thorium electric builder. Um, I've gotten a, kind of a rhetorical question, actually. Uh, if molten salt reactor 
uh, nuclear reactor generation of electrical power is so great, why has one not been built? And I have uh, a list of reasons that, that uh, one has not been built. One of the most significant ones is globalists plan to destroy our vulnerable uh, uh, U.S. electric grid, the power grid. It's very vulnerable to attack, and they plan to take it down. So they have no interest in enhancing the power generation. I don't have time to go through the rest of the, uh, the reasons, but I have uh, copies here, and if the, clerk, if the clerk would please pass these out, I'd appreciate it. I always mention I would refuse any government funding. So I'm not I'm not looking for money from any organization. Be completely in, uh, privately financed what I'm intending to do. Thanks for the time. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning. Um, so um, today I'd like to kind of talk about something that's popping up all over Placer County, and it's the 5G cell towers. Um, I know we've had a little um, meeting recently in Auburn about the sugar loaf being expanded and having more cell phone things for Verizon to come in. But I, I would like to point out, um, we don't have any long-term studies on 5G on the effects of people. We do have 4G studies showing it affects bees, it affects trees, um, the cellular structure of them. So that would probably affect our crops. And if it affects the bees, it affects our crops. And we're a big ag community here. And so I think not only that, I mean, it, it affects very young children's, their DNA structure, their cellular development. That happens when you put them into a electric car because the battery's in the back seat and we throw the kids in the back seat. And we don't have long-term studies of how much time a day, over weeks, over months, over years to know if that affects a child's development or not. But we do have studies showing 4G does cause issues. We're on 5G now, we're on the C band, so it hasn't opened up all the way. We still have a few more bands to go before it goes full force. And I don't know that we're actually looking at long-term effects on people, animals, and our environment. Um, back, if we want to do a little history, DDT used to be a good thing. Smoking was a good thing. Um, glyphosate was a good thing, Roundup. That's all being pulled off our market now. And the science that we use to determine the safety amount of radiation that's coming off these towers I don't know where it comes from, but my guess is it comes from a prescribed set of science that said all these other things were okay and healthy and good to use for the environment before. I love that Placer County wants to be the go-getter, wants to stay on trend, wants to be a leader, but I think it's really important to think about what the long-term effects are of this on people, because 70% of population is ill. They're deemed ill. They have diabetes, heart problems, autoimmune disease, and we don't really know if somebody's in a weakened immune system what this does because there are no long-term studies. So I really think it's something to start thinking about um, because we're going to be putting up more and more towers. I don't think they should be near schools. I don't think they should be near where older people live. And um, I just hope you guys will consider this. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Are there any other public comments in the room? Do we have anyone on Zoom?
Mr. Garabedian, go ahead and give your comments. Hi, Mike Garabedian, making a, a personal comment. Uh, after the, the county approved moving the uh, high, high voltage transmission lines, moving development closer to it in a report from the staff that said there was no proof that EMF was harmful medically, I attended the first uh, national EMF medical conference in Santa Cruz that lasted for three days. And there is a wide variety of international um, research and proof about the harm this causes uh, to uh, certainly to animals and people. So I am glad to hear the informed input you had from the earlier speaker on the subject. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I see no further <clears throat> comments. Okay, then we're going to close our public comment period and move to board member and county executive reports. I'll start with our county executive. Oh, Jim, did you want to go first or no, following? Okay. Good morning. Thank you, board chair. Uh, I just wanted to share a bit on the latest developments on our staff team efforts at the Placer County Government Center. Um, at our most recent county task force meeting, our homeless liaison team, which is comprised of representatives from CEO, HHS, probation, CEDRA code enforcement, the sheriff's office, uh, facilities and risk management, discussed an approach aimed at working collaboratively with the campers and volunteers from the faith community with hopes of avoiding future clean and clear operations. Recently, staff began informing campers of our revised approach and explained to campers and the faith community that if we can work together to keep the site clean and safe, it may obviate the need for future more expansive clean and clears. Campers were very appreciative of this news and immediately began to clean and organize the campsite, filling up a six yard dumpster within a couple of hours. Placer People of Faith, who comes off into this meeting to comment, has expressed his interest in helping with camp cleanup efforts uh, that will be occurring this week. A special shout out to our county task force members and their commitment to find an effective but compassionate approach to working with the campers at the Placer County Government Center. In particular, I want to give thanks to the efforts of Aaron Johnson and James Corey from probation and Matt Randall from Public Works who have really stepped up to support this effort in keeping with board direction. Thank you, Jane. Supervisor Holmes. Well, th thank you, Jane. I was at that meeting, and I appreciate your comments because exactly what happened. And I was I was glad to see the collaboration, uh, everybody working together to address this issue. And again, it'd be more of a compassionate and effective means of moving forward. So thank you uh, for your report. Uh, a couple things: I was at the rural county representatives of uh, California at uh, their last meeting. Uh, we were pleased that Fiona Ma from the treasury the uh, state treasurer's office popped in and gave us a little uh, presentation about all the programs that are available through the count through the state treasurer's office i don't have time to repeat them all but it was nice that she just dropped in and talked to us about what was going on and then uh the chief executive officer of pg and e patty poppy uh was there i don't know if you've any have any of you have met her so far uh, this is the second time I've been met with her, uh, and she's really put uh, a new face on PG&E, reaching out. Uh, this is, like I say, this is the second time I uh, was involved with her. Uh, she spent nearly an hour talking about her vision for PG&E moving forward, uh, understanding that you know, there needs to be some changes made. Uh, she wants to reach out locally for our local uh, uh, offices so we have uh, an opportunity to meet with her and so she spent a good uh, like I say almost an hour uh, addressing there was 30 county supervisors uh, in the room and uh, she answered a lot of questions and uh, it's really refreshing to see a face of pg e that's not something uh, up in the high tower uh, so anyhow that was uh, really uh, grateful if you get a chance she'll be around so if you get a chance to meet her uh, it would be really worthwhile Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Gore? Yes, I just wanted to give an update on the Placer Conservation Authority meeting. Supervisor Wygant and I serve on that. And last week, we were able to approve um, an agreement to purchase two large pieces of property, uh, Moyer East and, well, 
purchased Moyer East property, 241 acres of great, um, what would you call it, Robert? Um, high value conservation wetlands land, habitat. wetlands habitat. Um, so we agreed to purchase that. This is a part of a, working with Amoruso Ranch and their fees for uh, their development. And then uh, we're actually also have a land dedication credit um, for the Moyer West property, 264 acres as well. And so um, I just wanted to share that work continues to move forward as development is happening in our county. Uh, we are also collecting fees and land to mitigate uh, for that development so that we can protect our habitat. And so just exciting. I wanted to give you a quick update as we move forward in this process. That's great. Thank you. Any other board reports? Um, I had a quick one. Um, Supervisor Jones and myself attended the federal summit in Lake Tahoe last Tuesday, um, where we heard from a lot of elected officials. Many county staff attended as well, and I was really pleased with that to to engage our county staff on a you know vital resource to our community and to our constituents of Lake Tahoe. Um, the, the real benefit, I think, to the summit annually is a recommitment from the federal officials to do their part. Um, those of us at the local level are working on it day to day. The states work with us much more closely and obviously when our federal representatives can be there and hear and meet with um, the others and collaborate on solutions because so much of the Tahoe Basin is owned by the federal government, you know, almost 80%. So um, that was great. And then Congressman McClintock uh, was with us to open the Martis Valley Trail. Placer County built that last section, so now we've completed 4.6 miles. There's more to go to get uh, actually up to North Star Village and then over the summit. Um, but again, that's taken a lot of federal assistance um, to navigate the issues um, with the Washoe tribe through their ancestral lands and the Army Corps' lands uh, and to make that project successful. So a great step forward. And our county funding is limited to transient occupancy tax funding on that that's generated from that area. So it's not impacting um, general fund from the county. So great, um, great project. So with that, if we don't have any other board reports, then we'll move on and we'll go to our 930 timed item which is our agriculture annual crop report good morning board uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning Josh Hunsinger Placer County Agricultural Commissioner and I don't have a PowerPoint presentation for you but you should have a copy of the crop report in your board packet. so um, I'm just going to give you a really quick little overview of the 2021 crop report so that is last year's we publish it um, you know the next year afterwards after we kind of close out the year and start gathering statistics so what's really exciting about this year is that it is our second record crop report in a row. Last year, we had our first crop report ever to break $90 million for 2020. And then for 2021, it was our first crop report to break $100 million. So we've had two just major leaps in agricultural crop value in the last couple of years and our first ever crop report to break $100 million. So that is uh, really exciting. That is directly related, um, I believe, to the um, continu continued strength kind of across the board. If you look, there's a, there's a few ups and downs uh, by sector, but for the most part, everything was pretty solid and consistent. And then on top of that, um, our nut tree crops in the western part of the county, our almonds and walnuts, continue that acreage that's been planted over the last five or six years continues to um, come into bearing as those young trees mature and begin to be harvested. Um, we have probably about $20 million worth of, of value, gross value between just those two crops that we didn't have five years ago or, or even three years ago. And so that's, that's really exciting. I think that's uh, directly related to um, kind of the statewide trend around water availability and just the prudent management that um, a variety of uh, partners, including the county, have over water in Placer County. And so I think uh, farmers are recognizing that that um, 
that um, real uh, gift that we have in the way of a good water supply and are willing to make those long-term really significant investments in agriculture here in Placer County. Um, the other thing I will mention is that you know probably five or six years ago we, we used to publish just a little black and white statistical crop report. It wasn't very exciting. It was just like two pages long and just gave the very bare bones stats. And then we started publishing this nice um, more detailed pretty, if you will, crop report with lots of pictures in it. And I think it's really over time served as a very nice showcase of uh, really uh, not only um, significant from an economic perspective, but also just a really uh, beautiful showcase of Placer County's open spaces and agriculture. And with that in mind, we've, we've started adding some new features that we didn't have in the past. A couple of the um, brand new ones for this year that I'm really excited about are um, we worked with our museums department because um, we had crop reports back to the year 1940 and I could never find anything before 1940. I love Placer County history. And so I worked with museums and I said, hey, do we have, did, did crop reports exist prior to 1940? And so they've, um, they've, they actually did a search and it turns out the crop report prior to 1940 was just a little column, a little kind of single column on the front page of the Auburn Journal that was printed once a year. And it uh, published, it doesn't give dollar values, but it does give the production value in either rail cars or boxes or crates. And so uh, we took the 20 or the 1921 crop report and actually published it on one page. So, so looking back a hundred years, you can see what the crops were in 1921 within that report. So that was really a fun one and a real shout out to um, our museums department who helped with that research. Um, additionally, at Supervisor Holmes' request, we have added a small section on our equestrian industry. Although we don't consider it agricultural production in the traditional sense, um, we're recognizing that it, it's kind of a related industry and it's actually very significant economically. A um, couple stats that we were able to pull together. Um, the estimated horse population in Placer County is between nine and 14,000 horses, which is a lot. And the overall economic impact, um, while it's a little bit of uh, you know a, a shot in the dark, I think um, the number we settled on was around um, seventy-two million dollars in just kind of gross economic activity going on around our equestrian industry, which is you know no small matter. That's a, that's a lot of activity going around or a lot going on around our equestrian industry. Um, and so those are just a couple of examples of, you know, if you have other specific agricultural related things that you're interested in expanding on, I think this, this report can continue to evolve into something that really continues to showcase different sectors and different aspects of Placer County's um, kind of rural environment as well as our agricultural industry. Um, so with that, um, that concludes my report. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Yes, Supervisor Gore. Well, thank you, Josh. Appreciate the report. I appreciate the history that you gave us at the Ag Tour. Started reading that the other day, and it's really fascinating. Speaking of which, so you didn't say what the top um, oh, yes. products were 100 years ago, but I, if I can read this correctly, plums and peaches. Yes. Uh, and apparently, wine or wine grapes had dropped pretty low yes. after and during Prohibition, but I know that they were higher. Um, prior to that. Um, and then just one um, piece of information because of the Ag Tour that we had, um, we have decided um, District 1 and District 2 we're going to do a town hall, an Ag Town Hall, so that we can talk to our residents um, that live in the suburban areas how to interact with agriculture, right? Because we've got a lot of homes that are right on the on the border of almond trees, et cetera, and just really allowing people to understand when they hear that big bang, what is what is that noise, why you shouldn't be running through orchards uh, when they're spraying pesticide or something like that. So um, I'm looking forward to that. That will be Monday, October 17th at West Park High School, and we look forward to partnering with you as we share this information with our residents. So Absolutely. I really appreciate your, your hard work, Josh. Thank you. Supervisor Holmes. Yes, uh, thanks, Josh. I really appreciate the equestrian uh, <laughs> follow-up. You've exceeded my expectations once again. And this uh, report is, is really, really valuable, particularly in the uh, history of agriculture. Uh, it was interesting to note that uh, Newcastle uh, Fruit Sheds was the highest one that uh, sent fruit out 
uh, from from Placer County. There's others. There's Loomis and uh, the one in Auburn right across the street. But uh, Newcastle is the one that really stood out for me. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the fruits that were grown, that was the basis of our uh, economy back in uh, those days. And my family had a lot to do with that. And uh, actually grew a lot of pears back in the day or the pear blight and then switched to uh, peaches and apples. So it's a very well done and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Jane, you had a comment real quick and then Supervisor Wigan. Certainly, thank you, Board Chair. Um, just a brief postscript, Josh, to your excellent report. Um, in addition to the phenomenal crop report, I'd love to call everybody's attention to the great work that you and our communications team did to assemble a video story map tour of Ag in Placer County that's located on your Ag Commissioner website. It's a phenomenal resource to learn about this critical sector in our Placer economy. Supervisor Wagant. Yeah, first, congratulations, Josh, on uh, a continually improving ag report. Um, part of your job in Placer County, which is not normal across the state, is that uh, we always look for somebody who will not only do the state requirements that the job calls out for, but also promote uh, agriculture, and you get really high marks for that, in my view. Um, in my early part of my career, there was always this rift between uh, growth occurring at the expense of agriculture, and of course that inherently is obvious. But I think we've shown that uh, they coexist really well together if we plan and put in place excellent long-term plans. And again, Bonnie, looking forward to that workshop is going to be a step towards that. But uh, things have changed so much since I was a kid. Um, but I think our <coughs> urban population now actually demands that we be excellent custodians. Uh, of our agriculture, so I just want to want to thank you again. And then I have a question. Um, the, if I'm recalling correctly, which is uh, questionable, um, it seems like walnuts were planted uh, in earnest recently in about the last 15 years, and then almonds much more recently. But I was just I was actually struck this morning uh, that almonds are almost on parity uh, in sales with walnuts now. Do you see them continuing to grow and exceeding walnuts? And then, just a note, the, those taken together are, are a huge uh, component of, our, our, of a fairly new agricultural trend in the county. So Yeah. Well, well without my, my crystal ball, just to you know, put a little bit of uh, detail to, to that. So we had, prior to probably five or six years ago, we had about 900 acres of walnuts total in the county. So 900. And then... Uh, Walnut specifically over the last, uh, you know, that, that five, six year period, we had an increase to where we're somewhere around 4,500 acres. I have the exact numbers in here, but somewhere around that in total Walnut. So we've had, you know, probably an over 4,000 or almost 4,000 acre increase in uh, Walnuts. And similarly, we've gone from zero commercial almonds in the county whatsoever to um, around, again, a little over 4,000 acres of of almonds in the county and so that that's you know we went from 900 to you know somewhere north of 4,000 on the walnuts and zero to somewhere north of 4,000 on the almonds uh, you know it's without without you know without my crystal ball I will say that um, it seems like the almond market is a little bit stronger than the walnut market and so I if anything would speculate that that the almond acreage will continue to grow and probably surpass the walnut acreage I, I don't know that we'll see a reduction in walnuts but I don't see we'll I don't think we'll see quite the rapid growth that we've seen over the last few years in walnuts I think the almonds will probably eclipse walnuts fairly fairly quickly here thanks supervisor Jones hi Josh this is great I just wanted to com commend you this is a beautiful report not only beautiful but informative and I wanted to mention particularly the pest exclusion. Yeah. For those of you who didn't have a sister who worked for food and ag in pest exclusion, you wouldn't know that, that pest exclusion is extremely important to um, ag industries everywhere because these are the people who keep those pests out that destroy and devastate crops. And when my sister was in there, she talked particularly about the uh, pest that was out that would destroy the orange crops yeah. 
and she told my cousins in Florida and no one paid attention and I'll tell you a couple months back when I was there their orange their Valencia orange crops are devastated and all of their crops they're dying they they're just so far beyond repair they can't they can't recover yeah and actually item 17 on your consent calendar today was a new Asian citrus psyllid trapping contract so you actually just today approved a, a new contract to prevent that pest in Placer County so see, thank you see that's it's extremely important because the orange juice crops in Florida were huge and they're totally devastated now they're devastated their trees are just dying and the equestrian addition to this thank you Jim for having that because I have a huge equestrian population in Granite Bay and, and now in my new district too and they will really appreciate you um, shining the, the limelight on on them thanks Jim <laughs> thanks so much Josh you did a great job thank you um, and Josh my um Thank you. A great report, and I appreciate everybody's comments on it. I had a question on the organic side. Um, you've given a great report. How is that grown? Do you track that? How many acres and how many certifications there are? Oh, excuse me a second. I have a grandson in the back of the room who's visiting. Uh, so stop the show. That's Wilder Norman Gustafson visiting. Hi, Wilder. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Josh. He upstood. Uh, I saw a friendly face back there. <laughs> Not often we have friendly faces in the back of the room. Yeah. So, so, you know, I think there's there's two ways to answer that. One is a lot of the specific the 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 official organic certification is a big process to go through. It's not something that you can jump in and out of. Your ground has to be mm -hmm. treated as organic for, for 36 months before you, the first crop that can be actually right. called organic. Uh, that having been said, it does depend on some market dynamics. And if, you know, because I'll just give an example of rice, for instance, um, you know, the yield is about 60 to 70 percent of what it is for conventional grown rice and so there's there's a big hit and so the growers are trying to balance out in many instances you know the premium price that organic may receive versus the yield reduction that occurs because it's right. farmed organically and so you know a lot of it is is due to market demands what i will say in general about the ag industry is that over the last probably 20 to 30 years the ag industry has really changed practices to where more of what we consider our conventional farmers are incorporating more and more of what we call those in integrated pest management techniques to really while they're not certified organic while they still may use some conventional pesticides or fertilizers their overall approach is much more similar to what an organic grower would do and so you know I think that's a really positive trend um, the state's working a lot on how to incentivize growers to move to more and more of those sustainable practices in general regardless of whether they're officially an organic grower or not great well I appreciate seeing this and it'd be great to see the trend because we are having yeah. more and more farmers markets and farm stands and I know so many of our public want to buy sourced food from our own growers yeah. so wherever we can uh, at those markets it's great to buy placer county grown foods so absolutely that's great thanks Thank josh just, just one yes comment yes go ahead josh can we get some of these reports for our local for our district offices absolutely Thank you. Great. <laughs> good idea um are there any public comments on this item Hi, my name is Jennifer again, and um, yeah, the report's beautiful, and I was lucky enough to be here last year to, to hear it last year as well. Um, my, my only questions are um, right now is, and I don't know if this is in your department or not, but um, there's kind of been issues with sourcing um, fertilizer, um, and I don't know if it's gotten a lot more expensive since this report's done. If, do you think there will be an impact of uh, more expense to sell food because of the costs to grow it? Um, and also, um, I saw that you had a little bit of a livestock thing. And I know in Butte County, they've recently issued the influenza for the um, chickens. And I don't know if that's like to test them with the PCR test. 
And what happens is that test has been proven to be faulty, just like the PCR test was for human consumption. And so I'm just wondering if we are going to be culling um, a lot of our poultry here in Placer County, are we going to be cooperating with this letter, or do you have alternative ways to test so we don't have to cull our, any of our animals to keep these things going so we can keep thriving and having this beautiful ag community? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments on this item? Anybody on Zoom? Okay. Josh, did you want to respond to that? Sure. I, I think to the first item, um, this crop report represents only gross, um, what we call farm gate value. It has nothing to do with the profitability of our farms. And certainly the, the input costs over the last year or so have gone up, just, just like everyone in their own home, households, I'm, I'm sure, are feeling, you know, farmers even more so, whether it's fuel, fertilizer, anything based on petroleum has certainly gone up um, significantly. And so, um, you know, while our crop report has gone up, it, you know, that's not, doesn't have any maybe direct nexus to the, the profitability of our farm. So that's something to keep in mind. I think to the second, um, what, what I assume was being referenced is there is a, 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 or a, a disease, an avian disease called high path avian influenza that is um, primarily spread through wild birds. And um, that is not something my office directly engages in. That's the state veterinarian through the State Department of Food and Ag that um, oversees that. And um, they do um, do monitoring of both commercial flocks and um, then wild birds as well. Um, we do have some commercial poultry producers here in Placer County. Um, they have very strict uh, kind of biosecurity measures and um, including, you know, ways of excluding wild birds from interacting with their flocks because that's the worst thing is, you know, if, a, if an infected wild bird comes in and gets their flock sick and then the whole flock does have to be, um, you know, potentially depopulated in a worst case scenario. Um, it has not been found in Placer County. It has. It was found in, I think, a commercial pheasant farm in um, Butte County was the nearest find um, that, that she may have been referencing. Um, hasn't been, you know, uh, knock on wood, has not been found in Placer County yet, and I hope it stays that way. But that, that's as much as I have to share on that topic today. So. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that response. I'm not seeing any other board comments. This was just a report to us. We really appreciate it. We'd love to get more copies for all of our offices, I think. And really kudos to you and your staff for, for the efforts on the report. Thank you so much. And then I guess you can stay here for the next item, right? And Carrie will. OK. Then we'll move on to our uh, 945 timed item. This is our Civic Spark Fellowship Service te Term Overview. Hi, Carrie. Good morning. Good morning, Chair and Board members. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here this morning. I just want to provide a very brief introduction to Phoebe Rogers, who will describe her 11-month term as a Civic Spark Fellow with the Regional Forest Health Program and also the Air Pollution Control District. Just very briefly, the AmeriCorps uh, Fellowship Program, it's a federal program uh, that connects uh, emerging professionals with entities and organizations that need capacity and support primarily around community sustainability issues, including climate, water, uh, housing, and also equity issues. And so uh, within that AmeriCorps Fellowship Program in California, there's a separate uh, um, related program called Civic Spark, and that's very specifically designed to connect young professionals with uh, local government agencies, again, in need of support with uh, program development and implementation. So uh, Phoebe was a standout candidate. We chose her because of her amazing intellect, her clear commun communication style, and her um, incredible inquisitiveness around climate issues. And she has not disappointed any of us. I look forward to her being able to share what she's been able to accomplish for, for the Regional Forest Health Program and also for the Air Pollution Control District. And so on behalf of both of those programs this morning, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Phoebe Rogers. She graduated in 2020 with a bachelor's degree in psychology, which of course makes her perfect for any possible uh, job opportunity. <laughs> and so um, we snapped her up and I look forward to her sharing her term with you right now. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Welcome, Phoebe. Hi, everyone. Um, am I doing slides or? Okay, cool, this thing. 
Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm excited and grateful for the opportunity to come share a little bit with you all about my fellowship. Um, let's see. So, yeah, as Carrie mentioned, Civic Spark is a governor's initiative AmeriCorps program aimed at pairing young professionals with local government organizations throughout the state. Um, over the course of our 11 months of service, we all serve 1,700 hours, and that's split between our project service and also um, professional development training. So we attend a lot of regional trainings within the Civic Spark cohort, uh, doing resume building. And um, as you can see, there's a photo of us doing some bonding down in Sacramento. Um, we also lead volunteer engagement projects within our communities. So I had the chance to do that up in, um, up in North Lake Tahoe, doing uh, habitat restoration with the Truckee Land Trust. And yeah, Civic Spark is really just aimed at creating a lasting community impact in these positive service terms within communities. Um, and just some, some, some substantive context, if I can. I was actually an evacuee from the Calder Fire in August of 2021. Um, so I made the personal decision to take this fellowship while I was sitting in Tahoe City looking down at South Lake Tahoe, having just gotten the last of my personal belongings out of South Lake. So, this is a very meaningful fellowship for me, getting to work in mountain communities and forested communities, advocating for community resilience and also for forest resilience. Oops, sorry, my notes just closed. Um, let's see. So yeah, so to begin, um, I split my fellowship between the Regional Forest Health Department here in the county and also with the Air Pollution Control District. And um, I was curious how the two sides of this fellowship would kind of come together because my position was a little um, unorthodox within Civic Spark, having two service sites. Most people just have one. And I was excited to see how they would work together. And they actually came together in a really complex way because regional forest health is dealing with um, largely in part like the, uh, the uh, fuels excess problem we have in California and in our forests. And looking at how can we uh, advocate for forest health by removing those excess fuels out of the forest in order to preserve natural resources and our community resilience. And then the air pollution control side kind of was interested in how do we dispose of those excess materials in a way that is healthy for our communities, safe for our communities, and also preserves our air quality. So these kind of work together in a really interesting way. Um, for regional forest health, this was a new program, so I had the opportunity to really help uh, with program development and with capacity building. So the program purpose was um, to integrate forest management strategies and wildfire risk redu reduction strategies and also to coordinate with partners to preserve resources and um, to advocate for community engagement and keeping the community involved with these issues. And so my fellowship focus was really centered on the community engagement piece and with stakeholder collaboration and that intra-agency strategy coordinate coordination. So at the beginning of my term, Carrie and I identified these goals for my fellowship. Um, you can kind of take a look, but one I'd like to call your attention to is support the facilitation of this newly created program to help it serve as a model for other forested communities, and also to build outreach, an outreach database and support for future community engagement, and then to foster departmental collaboration on forest resilience projects in the region. And so some outcomes of my time with Regional Forest Health was that I created, or I conducted document review and priority and strategy alignment with multiple different county departments. So I worked closely with sustainability and planning and the Civic Spark Fellows placed there. We all kind of worked together, which was a nice opportunity. And I also worked with housing and transportation to look at these plans that have already been pre-approved and figure out where can those strategies align with Regional Forest Health strategies to help leverage this coordinating effort um, to really serve all these departments in one, in one uh, strong way. And then I also conducted research and program development uh, to streamline project identification and prioritization. So we took these, we took these strategies and we looked at um, like how, I guess I, I did some work researching uh, specific tools that the county could use to make us competitive for future funding um, to kind of help streamline these projects and uh, make us yeah, more competitive for future funding. And then finally, I created a stakeholder database to support collaboration, community engagement, and outreach. So I compiled 
all the people we could think of within Placer County and adjacent to Placer County that have a stake in fire preparation and community resilience. Um, Oh, and one key takeaway, sorry, one key takeaway of this side of the fellowship was the need for flexibility and adaptation. Because this was a new program, um, we were kind of figuring out what our, we were constantly on new trajectories trying to figure out the best way to serve the county and its constituents. So I learned a lot about having to meet the moment and having to really uh, be able to let go of all the things you were working on in order to really serve the county the best way. Um, and be flexible and learn things as we go. And so for the Air Pollution Control District, um, this side of my fellowship, the APCD is really focused on using forest health and wildfire mitigation as a vehicle for improved air quality and for public health. And so they have a long history of being engaged with wildfire smoke mitigation and the effects of wildfire smoke on public health. And as I mentioned, um, this side of the fellowship complemented the regional forest health side by looking at the forest waste problem we have and kind of thinking of creative solutions for how can we dispose of this waste in a safe way for our communities and also in a way that incentivizes that removal out of the forest. So I did a lot of research in biomass waste to energy conversion and I also helped uh, the district expand its capacity to respond to state planning documents, so the scoping plan update um, and that took form in doing a lot of research on black carbon and its effects. Black carbon is one of the main emissions from wildfire smoke, and so we looked a lot at its effects on public health and on climate. And so, like I mentioned with regional forest health, these are goals I identified at the beginning of my fellowship with Christiana Darlington, who I worked directly under during this fellowship at the APCD. Um, some of the goals include developing and expanding APCD knowledge on biomass technology, increasing APCD's understanding of black carbon emission impacts on wildfires and open pile burning, um, helping the APCD stay informed and connecting to local, state, and federal forest management and renewable energy policy, and also helping to develop outreach material on the best available biomass conversion technology to be shared with other agencies and stakeholders in California. And so the outcomes and highlights of this side of my fellowship were that I created a technological inventory of available biomass systems to help increase the agency knowledge of these systems. I created a literature review on the climate and public health impacts of black carbon, um, which is being circulated currently with biomass and air quality stakeholders in California. And I also helped support uh, the Air Pollution Control District's understanding of the, SCARB, uh, of the CARB scoping plan update and their capacity to comment on it. And in that, in that uh, capacity, I got to go to CARB and actually provide public comment um, at a public hearing in Sacramento on behalf of the APCD. Um, so a key takeaway from this side of the fellowship was uh, the benefit of using creative solutions for adaptation. I think that the work the APCD doing really gave me an understanding of having to work on your feet and be creative about how to address these climate problems. And I think that biomass offers, biomass waste to energy conversion offers a really cool opportunity for that. So in summary, this photo was taken, like I mentioned, the moment after I evacuated from the Calder fire and I was looking down at South Lake thinking about what I wanted to do next. And um, I'm so happy I got this experience to work in community and fire and forest resilience. I had a great year of practical professional experience and um, getting on the ground insights. Carrie and I did a lot of tours looking at fire areas and burn scars and I learned about tree mortality and um, the usefulness of forest treatment in mitigating fire severity. Uh, I got to work with a lot of different members of the county staff and collaborating on planning documents and getting that spirit of collaboration and the benefits that come from that. Um, I got direct policy experience, getting to go to CARB and engage with the public comment process and the regulatory process. And all in all, I just, it was a very exciting chance to be in the room where it happens. I've never really worked in such a practical, applied setting, and it was thrilling to get to just be in these conversations where change is being made to really advocate for community resilience. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all sincerely for sponsoring this fellowship and for giving me the opportunity to grow professionally and to learn so much about forest and fire resilience in the county. Thank you. Thank you. And I think the thanks ought to be to you <laughs> for bringing energy and enthusiasm and support to all of our county staff um, working on these really trying issues. So um, Supervisor Holmes. 
Thank you, young lady. Uh, you look like you are really enjoying yourself this year. <laughs> and it's exciting for you and exciting for us to see your enthusiasm. And so uh, really, you've really learned a lot. And it's a, a very robust experience for you. And I'm sure that you'll carry that with you. Uh, what are your plans going forward, if I may ask? Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually just decided to stay on with Christiana Darlington. I'm going to be working as a consultant for her mm -hmm. private company, working on bioenergy pro projects in the state. Wow, yeah. I think you're. I think you're going to move forward in this. <laughs> Once you start getting going down this path, you may not be able to get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll thank you very much for your enthusiasm. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Supervisor Jones. Yes, thank you so much for this report. Um, I have to commend you. Um, you're very impressive, very impressive for a young woman. Um, but I, you brought up something that I'm not familiar with, <clears throat> and that's black carbon and the, impact, uh, the impacts of black carbon. Could you enlighten me? Yeah, absolutely. I'll try to keep it brief because I spent six months researching black carbon. <laughs> um, so basically, black carbon is, like I said, one of the primary emissions of wildfire smoke. smoke and historically, it's been researched and regulated um, just as like a diesel combustion emission. So we don't quite know, we, we don't have a clear picture on um, what the full public health effect looks like of black carbon from wildfire. We have an understanding of what it looks like as um, part of the category of PM 2.5, but with wildfire, it's just such a, um, there's a lot of variability in how it presents chemically. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're, fi what we're finding out is that it actually it has a really significant climate warming effect, so it does contribute to really short-lived, instantaneous warming on regional climate. Um, and then it also has a pretty detrimental impact to public health, we're starting to find. Um, so my work with the Air Pollution Control District was really so that they could have that scientific understanding of black carbon in order to comment on the scoping plan update and advocate that black carbon from wildfire smoke be its own category and that more research be done to really enlighten us on these effects. Sure, so is black carbon is something that is, is released into the atmosphere with the fire or is it something that settles and remains after the fire? And yeah, the ash and technically it can do both. Um, we were looking mostly of, at the emission profile of black carbon, so it is an emission. So when the combustion in a wildfire event happens, um, based on the heat and severity of the fire, a certain percentage of the emission will be black carbon. And there's also white carbon and gray carbon and brown carbon. There's a lot of different, different forms of carbon. Um, wow. But black is the one that we're really concerned about. Um, and it also can stay on the ground. And black carbon, it's this really broad category in atmospheric science. And it can include soot or charred material. And there's soil-based black carbon. Um, but the, at the APCD, we were really looking at the emission of black carbon. I'm going to have to do my homework. That's a lot more carbons than when I was in school. <laughs> I can send you I the know about white, gray, and would you say white, gray, black, and brown? brown. And brown. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I can forward you my literature review, and you can read it. Yeah. Up. <laughs> no, I might be interested because um, I was a chemistry minor, but I think you've gone way beyond me by this point. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Supervisor Wygant. Just uh, congratulations and thank you. Your enthusiasm is tremendous and infectious, so I appreciate that. But um, uh, as you work with Christiana, keep in mind, I think Placer County is really well positioned to take a leadership role on forest management and its health and the benefits and get away from some of the horrible polarization that exists today and, and the vitriol around all of that. So good luck as you go forward, but thanks. Thank you. Great, thanks again, and we really appreciate it. Is there any public comment on this item? Not seeing any, so thank you so much and congratulations and we look forward to continuing to get to work with you in the other capacity. Thank you all so much. Uh -huh. Okay, we'll move to our 10 a.m. timed item. This is the final action of appeal of Planning Commission's denial of the Sorensen variance. Adam is here, Adam Anderson, to present this item. Cindy, before we start, I think, yeah. I think it's my job to announce that I wasn't here at the uh, July 12th uh, meeting, uh, but I did listen to the tapes last night, and so I'm positioned to hear this and uh, act on it. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, Supervisor uh, Gustafson uh, and members of the board. 
Uh, I'm Adam Anderson, and I'm here representing the Planning Services Division, and I will be detailing the item before you, which is the Planning Commission's denial of a variance called the Sorensen Variance, and this is an appeal of that denial. So this item was first heard by your Board of Supervisors on July 12th of this year. Uh, that hearing, uh, that hearing, during that hearing, you directed staff to make findings and recommendations of conditions of approval and return to you, and that is what we are doing today. Staff has created the requested findings uh, by reviewing the project for conformance with the California Environmental Quality Act and determined that the project would be categorically exempt from review pursuant to the set sections applicable to new construction of small uh, structures because the new structure uh, consists of less than 2,500 square feet of floor area and it does not include any hazardous materials nor is it uh, the surrounding area environmentally sensitive. Furthermore, we generated, there it goes. Furthermore, we generated findings that warrant the granting of the variance, which are detailed in the staff report, uh, but they focus on, our, on your previous discussion, specifically about the steep topography, the location of existing improvements, including the septic system, uh, the well, and the structures, uh, the, the residents as well. And we recognize that uh, removing, requiring removal uh, or relocation of the structure could cause more uh, impact to the site than what was previously done during the initial construction. Staff has also generated conditions of approval as well. The main components of those conditions of approval require uh, the appellant to get a grading permit and a building permit. Uh, those permits must be applied for and received within 90 days from this date, and then they would be considered exercised once we have issued those permits and the, uh, the first inspection of the foundation, and we would require that within 180 days. Uh, and the recommended conditions of approval, there we go, that's the slide I was looking for. <laughs> uh, our recommended action is on the screen if your board decides to take that, uh, that action today, and please let me know if you have any other questions. Thank you, Adam, appreciate that. Any questions, board members? Supervisor Jones? Yes, you said they have to pull permits within 90 days? Correct, well they have to submit for their permits within 90 days. Okay. They must have those uh, permits issued and the first inspection done on the foundation within 180 days. Okay. Do you know, are they waiting until we come with our final determination before they do anything or have they attempted to? Uh, they have begun the process, uh, but I don't know, I would let them speak as to where they are. <laughs> okay. okay, we'll ask. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate Any it. other questions, board members? Mr. Sorensen, would you like to speak and address this item? Good morning. How are you? Uh, I was speaking on this because the 90-day extension or to get the grading permit, I don't see that that's enough time for me to be able to do it. We've um, kind of opened up a big can of worms on this. Um, the my surveyor has found that the marks that the person on that side of me is not correct. So that takes the wing wall that we're talking about the, to a different point. And the engineer that is gonna design this is saying that brings in a whole bunch of different scenarios about how to fix it and he's been working on it and the surveyors to get these people going any f faster I, I don't know how to do that we, we've had them out there for the last three months looking over what we have to do in surveying but they don't give me any answers so I would like to see maybe that 90 days moved out a little bit further one of the other problems with that is that, <coughs> excuse me, that sorry. That's okay. 
Boy, I lost it. <laughs> I don't ever do that. No. Yeah. Never. It's, Never it's do tough. I forget someone's yeah, but name. But you speak all the or, time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a big difference. Yeah. Take a minute. Don't worry about that. But Adam, maybe you could address um, how staff could work with uh, Mr. Sorensen on that issue on the 90 days. Certainly. The um, ooh, sorry. Mm. The 90-day window was established based off of a conversation with our engineering and surveying de uh, department. They believed that based off of the plans that they had seen, 90 days was sufficient to expect an application. Furthermore, the 90 days and the 100 days were requested by our code enforcement um, office. They believed that that was a sufficient time to turn around and they didn't want to see this project linger because this has already been a, a as mm -hmm. if you're familiar with the timeline this project originally began back in 2015 so their goal was to have this wrapped up but that being said if mr Sorensen needs more time to to complete his project we would rather um, grant him the time than come back and do a uh, extension at a later date okay and uh, has it come back to you yeah it, oh it, good it does so, do that so the 90 days actually puts us into the start of winter so to be able to start that project and finish it doesn't, doesn't make sense to me because of where it is, and you've all been there, the, to be able to get in there and dig to fix it would just be at opening up for more water and stuff to come in there and create a problem in the wall that's already there. Okay. That's, I'm asking for the extension, and Adam's been very helpful uh, with me. Do you have and a specific request on that extension? Ex excuse me again? Do you have a specific timeline for your suggestion to wait till after winter? Com yeah, well. Is that what you're <laughs> asking? Uh, I'm not saying to a after winter. As soon as I can get something figured out for it, I will okay. go in and ask for the grading permit and stuff at that time but to tell you that it's going to all happen in 90 days or 30 days i don't know that uh, the engineer the guy that is doing that is telling me it changes from where the property line is and that maybe we can do something different in there to know that for sure <laughs> i don't know that Okay, great. Any other comments for the board? Any other comments for us? No, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you very Mr. much Sorenson. for hearing me. Is there any other public comment on this item? Okay. Mr. Garabedian, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Uh, thank you. Mike Garabedian, I have no familiarity with this issue, so can't comment on the the uh, project or the uh, appeal. What I would like to point out is just on the facts stated in the agenda uh, about the 3.74 feet from the property line and there being normally a 30 foot required uh, distance. Uh, when one structure is fully engaged in fire, it will ignite, ignite other structures within 30 feet. Uh, just happens to be the testing done by the insurance industry a while back, actually. So I'm, a normal part of this analysis uh, would be uh, whether there would be end up being structures within 30 feet of each other. And I, I wonder if there's any point to be addressed on that, but I am not uh, questioning anything about the outcome here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garabedian. Are there any other public comments? I see no further comments. Okay, then we'll close the public comments. Supervisor Jones, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to ask again. So you're saying that he has 90 days to do the paperwork. Can you explain that a little bit to me better to, to, to sure. he pull has, the permits uh, or to start? So there is a grading permit and there is a building permit involved in this, one for the retaining wall, one for the structure. He has 90 days to submit his application instructions or his application for both of those permits. Uh, we do not have a set time that those are required to be issued, but we have a set time for when the initial inspection is supposed to be done for the foundation, and we have a set time for when that uh, grading permit is to be issued, which is 180 days. So submittal within 90, 
issuance and first inspection within 180. Okay, so that's what I'm just trying to make sure you understand. They're saying you have to submit within 90 days. Not that you have to get anything completed within 90 days, but I'm also wondering if it might help if his surveyor came down and spoke with you folks because instead of his surveyor giving him this kind of like, well, I can't tell you how long it's gonna be, you know, kind of a thing. If he came down and spoke to you guys, maybe you could express to him that there are timelines in Placer County you have to comply with. And that if he doesn't get serious about helping his client, you know, he's the one who's gonna put our, his client at risk here again. And we recognize that this is a, bill, uh, a busy time yeah. for um, engineers, surveyors. Uh, it's a hot market still. Um, and we recognize that maybe it would be, uh, maybe they would require an additional amount of time, yeah. but uh, we haven't been given a specific amount. Right. To, so have your surveyor. All we've had to go off of is our existing uh, engineering and surveying department telling us that they believe that 90 right. days is sufficient for submittal. For submittal. So have your surveyor go talk to the county. <laughs> Supervisor, so Supervisor Gore or, or well, EJ, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, good morning, EJ of Aldi Planning Services Vision. So there's two conditions uh, of approval that deal with the timing. Uh, condition number three talks about uh, the 90 days that they must apply for a permit. Uh, and then the last condition, uh, number seven, uh, which talks about when they need to ex exercise or have issuance of the permit, which is out to February 2023. If the board wants to entertain additional time, I think staff would be comfortable with, on condition three, changing it from 90 days to 120 days to submit an application. And then uh, number uh, seven, as far as exercising this with the issuance of a grading permit, that's currently uh, a deadline of February 20, 2023. Uh, that could very well be in the rainy season. Uh, I would suggest extending that out to April 20th, 2023, another 60 days. I would. Um, I think that's a, a good solution. I see a, a head nod over there, and I think that, that based on the concern with just making sure you get what you need, not having to come back, I think that that would be helpful. I know you're going to do that. Um, and just sort of, if Mr. Garabedian is listening, um, there is no structure anywhere near this uh, piece of property. So I just want to clarify that, right, if I recall, being out there. So um, I think your recommendation would be fine, and if my colleagues would agree with that. I think that's reasonable. Okay, any other comments or questions, board members? Okay, so we have, is this one action for all three or do we need to take separate votes? I would take separate. Separate votes, okay. So the first action um, to approve the appeal filed by Sven Sorensen consistent with the tentative action taken previously by the board on July 12th, 2022. Jones and Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Second, find the project is categorically exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to section 15303 of the CEQA guidelines and section 18.36.0050 of the Placer County Environmental Review Ordinance, new construction or conversion of small structures. Do I have a motion? Jones and Gore, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? And then finally, uh, number three, finalize the tentative action to uphold the appeal and approve the variance to allow an existing shop to be set 3.74 feet from the north property line where 30 feet is normally required, subject to the findings and conditions of approval as amended, or found in the staff report as amended as we just discussed. Can I ask a clarification of staff? I don't notice in this motion anything about the um, zero foot setback uh, for the nine foot retaining wall. Should that be added into this motion? It, it is there on, on the agenda I believe it's portion. In there. Okay. It's not on the PowerPoint, but it is in the okay, agenda. The, what was just read oh. on the record did not include that. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, or the record includes the zero foot. Okay, Thank I you. was reading from your slide and right. not from the book. Okay. Do you want me to reread that or we just clarify that no, it's a zero foot that. setback for a, the nine foot retaining wall and then as amended. So motion. Thank you. Jones and Gore. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you staff for working this out. Thank you Mr. Sorensen. You're welcome.
Okay. We'll now move on to item five, public works. And this is 8810 Cook uh, Riolo Road, annexation to county service area 28, zone of benefit 171. Hi, Sarah. Hi, how are you? Good. Good. Well, thank you, Chair and Board Members. Again, Sarah Gilmore with Environmental Engineering and Public Works to present the annexation of the mentioned property. As stated in the Board Memo, we're requesting the Board open a public hearing to adopt the resolution, which is included in the staff report, to annex the property located at 8810 Cook Riola Road into the boundaries of County Service Area 28, Zone of Benefit 173 Dry Creek. This property is located at southwest of the corner of Auburn Block, Almond Blossom Lane and Cook Riolo Road in West Placer, and per the amended reimbursement agreement, there is no annexation fee due for this property. So staff report supports this request, and in order to move forward, we request that your board open the public hearing and adopt the resolution in the staff report to annex it into the boundaries of County Service Area 28, Zone of Benefit 173 Dry Creek, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. Any questions, board members? Okay, then we are going to open the public hearing. Do we have any public comment on the Senate? Not on Zoom. Okay, then we'll close the public hearing and clerk, will you announce the vote? The clerk's office received no protests on this matter. Great, thank you. So with that, we have um, a resolution annexing 8810 Cook Riola Road APN 023-240-0039-000 into County Service Area 28, Zone of Benefit 173, Dry Creek. Do I have a motion? Second. Gore and Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We need to show uh, Supervisor Holmes absent. Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you. Now we're at our 1030 timed item. This is Placer Ranch specific plan agreement regarding the de dedication of land in lieu of mitigation fees. And we have Chris Schmidt coming versus Michelle. You heard she got called to jury duty and we're she proud did. that our Placer County I'm employees are serving on jury duty. I'm pitching this morning. Chris Schmidt with the In Michelle Kingsbury. Uh, the item before you today is an agreement to pay in lieu of, or to dedicate land in lieu of paying mitigation fees for a portion of the land conversion obligation for the Placer Ranch Phase 1A project. So Phase 1A was approved by the Planning Commission uh, two weeks ago. This is the first portion of the uh, specific plan. It's all residential development. It includes 769 units located on the future south side of Sunset Boulevard, which will be extended westerly. It's also on the east and west sides of Finneyman Road at the terminus of Wood Creek Oaks. Uh, it's bordered to the south by the city of Roseville and on the north by the future Placer, um, Sex State Placer campus. So the item before you today is for approval and execution of agreement regarding a dedication of land in lieu of payment of a fee. The off-site mitigation land being uh, dedicated is north of the community of Sheridan. It entails uh, 297 acres. On August 16th, the Placer, Con the Placer Conservation Authority approved entering into this agreement. The authority will accept the land in lieu of fee payment for a portion of the land conversion fees is allowed through the Placer County Conservation Program. The offsite land on Camp Far West Road is approximately 297 acres, located north of Sheridan, south of the Bear River, and east of Highway 65. The offsite land is within the PCCP Reserve Acquisition Area and includes mostly vernal pool grass land and 8.6 acres of aquatic resources. This land will be dedicated to and owned by the PCA, and in exchange, Placer Ranch will receive credits that can be applied to a portion of the PCCP land conversion fee. So this shows the uh, estimated fees for phase 1A is approximately $7.8 million. The agreement outlines the total amount of fees to be paid by Placer Ranch for development of phase 1A and the necessary backbone infrastructure to support that phase. 
as detailed in the slide and in your report, the total amount of fees after accounting for land dedication credits is 5.2 million for the land conversion fee and 1.9 million for the specific habitat fee. The fees will be due and the land must be dedicated to the PCA prior to grading starting on the site. So just uh, an outline of what's happened with Plessa Ranch, as you know, the specific plan and also the Sunset Area Plan were adopted by your board in late December of 2019. In March, the board, the board approved an MOU between the county and California State University for the Sac State campus. In September of 2020, Placer Ranch and Cal State University entered into a gift agreement for the, uh, the campus land. And in June of 2021, Cal State University issued a notice of preparation for a master plan in EIR, which, they're, which is ongoing. Uh, the applicant, Gen CA Placer Ranch LLC, purchased the Placer Ranch specific land property last August, August 2021. As I noted, the Planning Commission did approve Phase 1A on August 11th, and on August 16th, the PCA did approve the in lieu fee agreement and offsite land dedication. That's before you today. So next steps for Placer Ranch Phase 1A will be to satisfy the agreement conditions, satisfy applicable conditions of approval for their tentative map. There is a pre-construction meeting scheduled for tomorrow morning on site. The Still must attain grading plan appro approval and expect to great break ground on the project in mid-September. Uh, the applicant has been keeping us busy. Uh, we are reviewing phase 1A backbone infrastructure, uh, villages five, six, and seven plan set. So those are the improvement plans. Uh, looking at Finiment Road Force Main extension plan set and also the sewer master plan that'll serve not only Placer Ranch, but also the North Sunset area plan. So the action requested today is to approve and authorize the chairperson or designee to execute the agreement regarding the dedication of the land in lieu of mitigation fees between the County of Placer, the Placer County Conservation Authority, and Gen CA Placer Ranch LLC, a California limited liability company for the Placer Ranch specific plan to mitigate impacts through combination of payment to Placer County Conservation Program fees and dedication of land and authorize the chairperson to execute the agreement and any amendments to the agreement, including but not limited to allocation of additional credits for subsequent phases of the Placer Ranch project. Also joining me here today is uh, Greg McKenzie of the PCA, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Whoops. Thank you, Chris. Um, any questions, board members? Hi. Supervisor Jones first, and then Supervisor yeah, Wagner. I'm kind of new to this, so I could use a little bit more clarification on how this works. Um, they're paying um, in lieu fees by purchasing other land and then dedicating it for conservation purposes. Exactly. So the value of that conservation land, is that what they pay for the land? Or is, it that, or is that just the value of the land? I, I don't understand how that works. I'm going to punch it to Greg. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, ladies and gentlemen. Greg McKenzie with my uh, executive director of the PCA hat on today. We're all wearing multiple hats these days to get things done. So relative to the land dedication in lieu of fees. Um, so the land conversion fees in this case is what we're seeking or they're seeking to dedicate land to cover a portion of those fees. So the way the cost and funding program for the PCP was established, it allowed, under the section that Chris outlined, 33% of the land conversion fees, which were really the land cost, to be covered by the dedication of lands that meet our criteria. Is it of the sufficient size? Is it 200 acres or, or greater? Does it have occupancy of vernal pool species? This property does, fortunately has vernal pools, uh, vernal swales on the property. Uh, it's in an area that we're trying to conserve and protect up northeast of Sheridan, so it's in the right location adjacent to the Bear River. So it's checking lots of boxes. So how do we get to the value of that land? It's not necessarily what they paid for it, it's what the value it is under the conservation program. So as I addressed the PCA board at last week's board meeting, 
We've done recent appraisals. We've been acquiring lots and lots of lands. The supervisor Gore mentioned her board report earlier today. Um, I think last week we had roughly 1,500 acres come in in one meeting. Um, this one included, so you know, another. This one's 297 acres, so a fairly significant amount of land. Uh, so those appraisals, um, we were always concerned. This board was always concerned with appraisals reflecting the value of conservation. Uh, historically, they have never reflected the true value of conservation. They look at ag um, values for grazing lands, for instance. This would be probably seen as by an appraiser as a, you know, a grazing land assigned a grazing value. Well, we know because of the conservation values between the wetlands, the vernal pools, the species occupants, and its ability to be restored uh, that it has much greater value. So it became a negotiation effectively between myself, the applicants, and having the support of our appraised values behind it. Um, just to give you, for instance, this land would be valued at 11,500 per acre. It's lower than other values that we have established for conservation lands. It has wetlands, not as high quality as some other properties we've recently acquired. Uh, this land was actually used as a comparable for the Red Wing acquisition, which we go to the Wildlife Conservation Board on Thursday for state and federal funding to acquire. That one came out at 14,500 per acre. Uh, and so this 11,500 per acre, it's less than that. We, the, your board approved the purchase and we have owned it for several years now. The Bradley property, 400 acres, also in that area. We paid $13,250 per acre for that property. Again, better conservation value. So it's, it's really looking at conservation values, looking at where the market's at, and seeing where we can strike a deal with the applicant. What would we pay for this if it weren't for them, if we had to go out and negotiate for this land separately? And having lands dedicated in lieu of fees actually provides us with a lot of efficiencies because we're not out there chasing properties in the real estate market, competing with the developers who have a lot of these lands, artificially increasing prices. So it's actually very helpful uh, to us, and there's you know, uh, upside to us in the acquisition process with right. these lands. Right, so is there some like um, investigation? Do you know the lands that you're going to use in advance, or is it something that occurs when, when this whole process starts? Yes, we, we have a, a running list okay. of prioritized lands. It really started with the uh, reserve system, the reserve acquisition area, and the negotiations with the state and federal agencies over that area. We've always seen this as it, it's on the list. It has vernal pools, it has occupancy. It's a good piece of property, and it lends itself well to the reserve systems. Okay, so it's not necessarily an acreage for acreage. It's a value. Right. Okay, and not to... <clears throat> Just think about my own district, but is there anything in my district that could possibly be come under conservation? We are keeping a close eye on especially the stream systems in Granite Bay and opportunities there as they come along either through developers dedicating lands or by us finding things that it, it's difficult, you know, having things split up. So we in Granite Bay, so we really have to focus on the stream system, which may be lots of small pieces to get to an overall acreage that works for. And it's not just your board, it's also the state and federal agencies uh, that have to approve that and see it as being a value added to the reserve system. Right. So much like this property went through that process with the state and federal agencies, any other addition to the reserve system that we might bring forward right. to you has to go through that same process. Okay. So does all or part of, of the Granite Bay area come is within the PCCP? It's within the plan area. That's correct. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Supervisor. Supervisor Wygant. <clears throat> Just have to take this opportunity to, uh, uh, one, thank staff, all of you, for uh, what's actually an incredibly complicated devil is in the details types of issue, but it's really a milestone, I think, for the county whereby uh, we're seeing some stunning benefits of really competent long-range planning, which inherently I think our CEDRA department has always been good at, uh, but a uh, conservation plan was an effort that was, of course, 20 years in the making. Uh, and the goal was to, in the Sunset area, 
and the Placer Ranch project, which were concurrently evaluated through planning uh, to be a place for primarily job creation. Uh, and the conservation plan uh, the goal was to create much better conservation here in Placer County than would normally occur and to a much better benefit to people who live here because the conservation would not normally have to occur in Placer County. Uh, so this is our first in lieu uh, transaction, which makes the permitting even easier. Um, and sometimes these permits have taken in our county nine years to achieve. Uh, so here we have uh, a project in the sunset area uh, being permitted uh, partially in this phase under the conservation plan, uh, which will include a 300 acre California State University campus. So again, uh, thanks to the great work at the staff level and for the benefit of the public, I think it's worthwhile taking time to, to mention that. Thank you, Robert. Supervisor Holmes? Yes, Robert, I agree. Uh, this is a historic milestone uh, in the Placer County Conservation Plan coming to this board. <clears throat> and Robert, uh, you must be very proud or grateful that this actually is coming before you leave office. <laughs> I mean, for the better part of 28 years, this is what your goal uh, has been. You've done a remarkable job stewarding this and bringing this forward. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to be part of it. So thank you. I don't see any other comments from board members. Are there any public comments on this item? There is one. Mr. Garabedian, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Uh, thank you, Mike Garabedian for Placer County Tomorrow. Uh, the PCCP was proposed, developed, approved, and is being implemented with little essential public information involvement and accountability. Uh, we have no, we know of no needed level of oversight of the PCCP now or when it was being developed. Uh, and we oppose this agreement, this agenda item, and the destruction of well-functioning wetland areas that it would uh, facilitate. Uh, the uh, public has little, it, with, for the 450-mile PCCP area, uh, do not know what the PCCP, the PCA, and the PCA Authority Committee are and are not engaged in it, nor are they following it. And I don't see it, for instance, on MAC agendas or supervisors' reports. So other than cursory stories without contact, there has been little or no local regional paper or other coverage of this. Certainly some kind of major insert is needed in all the newspapers in the affected area has yet to be done to bring this forward to the public. The meeting last week on the 16th, the special meeting, uh, raised a number of issues. We raised a number of issues about this, including the need to allow time for review of the 500-page documents, now over 600 pages. This week, uh, during a preparation of the PCCP, it was reported that it would cover 27 species, but there are only 14 in it. Now, last week, one species was explained. It was dropped out of the Bear River, but and maybe, well, I don't want, want to try to categorize what was said. But some, who is watching out for those? You know, if the PCA isn't dealing with those other species, those other 13 species, who is? Are they just being ignored or what? So we have one more Board of Supervisors meeting today on the PCCP that the PCA and its advocates will say where this was brought before the public many times and the public knows all about it. Well, <laughs> the state and federal agencies during <laughs> met in secret from the public and they still meet in secret from the public. The public can't go to those meetings or know what they're doing. So we should we're concerned about this re resolution allowing the chair, I don't know if it's the PCA chair, the Board of Supervisors chair, to approve further amendments to this agreement and not requiring any further review of allocating later additional credits uh, for Placer Ranch destruction of more protected areas. About the ACA advisory group meeting last week, uh, I don't see the timing here, I'm not sure how much time I have left. Uh, the, uh, Ed Pandolfino, uh, who was going to do a, a natural uh, grassland area talk but had to leave for family reasons. Uh, he was replaced by someone we oppose because that person has none of the credentials and involvement in the issue whatsoever compared to Ed's. Here, Ed was a major conservationist scientist, and we don't have that. We also opposed reappointment of Marcus Loduca, certainly a, a good gentleman, but also and also the uh, the Placer Ranch advocate who are on the uh, Placer County. 
uh, con uh, authority advisory committee. We need more pu public there. And um, so essentially uh, quite Mr. concerned Garibedian, about this. You need to wrap up your comments. Your time. Very grateful for this opportunity to bring this issues uh, before you as well as we could. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garibedian. Is there any other public comment on this item? Good morning, members of the board. Anton Garcia with Taylor Billers, the applicant. Um, don't worry, this is not a presentation, but I think the <laughs> application and staff report. Um, just wanted to just, well, first of all, I just thank staff. And, and for those who've been involved in the PCCP, this is um, obviously a, a significant milestone, as Supervisor Wangan had mentioned. Um, to get to this point, there's guessing hundreds of public meetings to get to this point, um, and certainly for not only for project, but for the county, um, a big day um, to move. Um, forward with what's been programmed and planned for, for, for quite some time. A couple of things to know, I just, um, we provided a grant deed, um, it's in possession of the county with respect to the property that was acquired um, as part of the in-lieu agreement. Um, we've also entered into escrow. Um, so that's been opened up for what I believe is the, um, the mitigation lands as defined in the, um, the PCCP for reservation acquisition agreement. And um, assuming we can receive your approval today, we'd be looking to pay the fees outlined in the agreement as um, soon as possible. Our plan is to break ground on the project for our phase 1A, which was approved by the Planning Commission on the 11th of this month, um, here over the next uh, few weeks. We've been working with uh, CEDRA on various plans, grading plans, um, a slew of other improvement plans to, to get to this point. So once again, I'm very encouraged by the, the, the support we've received from the Planning Commission, I think the board on the PCA. Um, and the rest of uh, county staff because it's no small feat to, to get to this point um, in the amount of time that we've um, um, acquired the property, which is just shy of just, just a little over one year ago. So once again, I just want to thank everyone. If there's any I'm sure technical comments, I'm sure Mr. Kenzie and Mr. Schmidt can answer. Um, if not, maybe I can, but um, thanks again for your consideration. Thank you. Any further public comment? Okay, then we'll close the public comment. Any board comments or questions to follow up on? Supervisor Wigand. Well, I'd be remiss, first of all, I didn't thank Michelle for her work and uh, uh, sorry that she's not here, but I want to highlight that uh, county employees and board of supervisors also do jury duty. <laughs> we're, we're not exempt. Um, and I'll move approval of staff recommendation. Again, thank everybody for uh, bringing us to this point. Second. Okay, Supervisor Wigand and Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Great job. Now we'll go to our 1045 time to item, Health and Human Services, Placer County Mental Health Services Act Annual Update and Expenditure Plan. And Sue Compton is here. Good morning, Supervisor Gustafson and distinguished members of the board. It's nice to see you. My name is Sue Compton. I'm the Mental Health Services Act Coordinator for Placer County Systems of Care, and I'm here with our director, Amy Ellis. Today we're requesting the board to take the following actions. Adopt the County Mental Health Services Act Plan Annual Update for fiscal year 2022-2023, which includes the fiscal year 2017-2021 Prevention and Early Intervention Evaluation Report, and the final report for the Homeless Integrated Care Coordination and Evaluation Innovation Project, and to approve the expenditure plan for fiscal year 2022-2023 in the amount of $24,092,918. The Board of Supervisors is required to, by the state to approve the MHSA annual update and their expenditure plans. The annual update this year reports on fiscal year 2020-2021 data and any proposed changes for this upcoming fiscal year. For just over 15 years, Placer County has been using state funding from the Mental Health Services Act to expand intensive mental health and crisis services for our community, for people with severe mental illness, and develop evidence-based prevention programs to reach those who are at risk of mental illness. And county and community-based providers have been working diligently over these past few difficult years in particular to ensure mental health supports and preventative services continue to be delivered to our residents. These services will continue as we enter into the third year of our three-year plan. 
76%, so the majority of our MHSA funding goes to Community Services and Supports, or CSS, with half of that going to our full service partnerships. Um, those, those services provide whatever it takes 24-7 mental health wraparound services. And for 2020-2021, they delivered those services to 486 residents in Placer County. For adults enrolled in what we call our FSPs, at least two years, they, those reporting residency and psychiatric hospitalizations decreased by 46%, incarceration by 44%, and homelessness by 24%. The annual expenditure for full service partnerships is approximately $10 million a year. Non-full service partnership community services and supports served over, served over 3,000 residents in our community of all age groups with evidence-based programs aimed at system transformation, including community-based individual and group mental health services, culturally specific supports, peer and family advocacy services, housing and supports with nearly 140 beds for our community, crisis services, embedded school and county wellness centers, and our 211 services. The expected annual expenditure for non-FSP community services and supports is about $8.5 million. A portion of our CSS funding can also go towards workforce education and recruitment, and also our capital facilities and technology needs. Workforce education and training is budgeted to expend about $390,000 annually to provide training of professionals and paraprofessionals in evidence-based interventions and cultural responsiveness, leadership development, increased availability of e-learning for our education and development of mental health career pathways, which is a much needed item in our state right now. Capital facilities and technology needs provides approximately half a million dollars annually for our behavior, behavioral health facility renovations, our existing electronic health record system enhancements, and a dedicated MHSA data portal system that we rolled out last year. So the 19% uh, of our Mental Health Services Act funding goes towards prevention and early intervention services. And those serve about 4,000 residents with short-term interventions aimed at preventing mental illness from becoming severe and disabling educating for increasing recognition of the early signs of mental illness, suicide prevention, and stigma and discrimination reduction activities in our community. About three and a half million dollars funds 41 community-based services, strengthening families and youth with parenting classes, therapy, social skill development, and culturally appropriate services. Counties are required to submit a prevention and early intervention um, evaluation report every three years to report on the impacts of our PEI programs in particular. Our report was due this year, and it includes actually four years of data to cover 2017, 2018 as well, and it goes through fiscal year 2020, 2021. Despite challenges faced during the pandemic, including workforce shortages and less face-to-face -face consumer access, over 1,200 individuals uh, received prevention services during fiscal year 2020-2021 alone. And 80% of those received a pre and post of those who received a pre and post assessment showed improvement in their symptoms over time. The remaining 5% of our MHSA funding goes towards innovation projects, which are designed to uh, develop a new strategy or a new learning in the county behavioral health system. Placer County's approved innovation project for the current uh, five years, which is on a different cycle than our three-year plan, is known as the Lotus Behavioral Health Center, which some of you may have visited recently as it will be opening uh, very here uh, soon, actually, I believe in the next week or two, two weeks. <laughs> this is our 24-7 adult crisis respite center that will be at our Kirby Hills campus. It's utilizing multiple funding sources, including Medi-Cal and hospital funding, and 550,000 per year of innovation dollars from MHSA. We completed a five-year innovation project that was connected to our whole person care project. That is the Homeless Integration, Integrated Care Coordination and Evaluation Project. So we had our final report that was due for that, which is included with our annual update as well. 
And the final, um, the final report shows 504 total individuals were served with 187 whole person care members successfully housed over the life of the project. And partnering agencies and programs have learned opportunity, important lessons about collaboration and coordination from this successful project. The annual update, these reports and associated expenditures were vetted with the Mental Health, Alcohol, and Drug Advisory Board. Our local stakeholder uh, steering committee, the Campaign for Community Wellness, or CCW, and was posted for 30 days to receive public comment. A public hearing for the annual update was held by the Mental Health, Alcohol, and Drug Advisory Board on June 20th. Comments included several identified errors that were corrected, recognition of the underserved older adult population that still exists in our community, the importance of our peer services, and the need for ongoing education with providers around cultural humility and inclusive and equitable practices. And also acknowledging ongoing efforts that are needed to improve the accessibility of the content in the reports for our community. CCW has noted the positive results of the investments made with the Mental Health Services Act, and they support the continuation of these programs to improve much needed services and supports for all people in Placer County experiencing mental health issues. No county general funds are required as part of this action item. At this time, we'd like to request the board adopt the fiscal year 2022-2023 MHSA annual update, associated reports, and expenditure plan. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Sue. Any questions, board members? I'm not seeing any questions from the board. Is there any public comment on this item? Jennifer is coming up. Hi, uh, Jennifer again. Um, so my, my only question is we, we heard lots of very good services that were in the program, um, but it seems like we're missing like one very basic service, which is like proper nutrition, proper health. Like I don't know if that's really in there, but um, with the counseling or whatever, but I think like having like a general promotion of healthy lifestyle may help to benefit people that are like on the border of going into these programs and not so there's like some sort of resource to go to in that respect if that makes sense because we don't have healthy lifestyles in america there's chemicals in all the foods and while it's said so much of that a day is okay to not affect our brains and our body we are inundated with it between shampoos, um, soap, food, all kinds of different things, even our clothing. And they create a lot of issues too with sexual identification because they create a higher estrogen level in people. And I think giving people some information about how to live a healthier lifestyle could maybe prevent some of this stuff, especially with a lot of medications, SSRIs, for example. They um, actually create a lot of other mental health issues in the long run. Um, and I'm not saying not to medicate people, and I'm not saying it can't be beneficial, but I don't know if the way we are medicating people is maybe the best way. So I don't know if there's a way also to put money towards research to look at other ways to help create healthy lifestyles, create healthier medications even for people to get. And I don't think it has anything to do with what you're voting on today, but I think it's something that might be good to add in at some point. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Any other public comments on this item? Sue, would you like to address any of the public comments that came up? Sure. I appreciate um, you know, the awareness around the holistic approach for dealing with mental health. And um, MHSA actually does do a lot of integrated approaches. And especially with our full service partnership, for instance, we collaborate, it is, an, it is a wraparound system. And so we do collaborate with medical doctors and so forth as, as far as somebody's health care. 
um, what they're doing for their own personal um, hygiene, their own nutrition, um, to be able to take care of themselves and to be able to take care of their own mental health. And, and there's a lot of community collaboration with MHSA that we've seen. Um, we have feedback like that that comes in as far as looking at evidence-based programs that take consideration of the person's whole health um, as far as their mental well-being. So I, I do appreciate those comments. Um, and then as far as medication as well, you know, these are things that we're always looking at from the state perspective as far as um, what is working best for our populations. And so those are things that are shared as far as best practices um, with all of the services that we provide that might have to do with um, medication supports. Great. Any follow-up questions from the board? Okay. Um, then we have two actions uh, before us to adopt the Placer County Mental Health Services Act plan update for 2022-23 and approve the expenditure plan for 2022-23. Move approval. Holmes and Wygant, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Sue. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, we're not quite to our 11.30 timed item, so we'll go to uh, department item number 11A. This is a change order on the new Health and Human Services Center at Placer County Government Center. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, Chair and Board Members. My name is Genevieve Vargas, Senior Architect with Capital Improvements, and I'm here today to request um, your approval of the change order number two to the construction contract with Turner Construction. Uh, for the Health and Human Services Project in the amount of $473,338, resulting in a new total contract amount of $80,263,115, and delegate authority to the Director of Facilities Management or designee to approve any necessary additional change orders in the amount not to exceed $210,000, consistent with the public contract code. On May 11th, uh, 2021, your board authorized the Director of Facilities Management to execute a construction contract not to exceed $79,789,777 with Turner Construction for the Health and Human Services Center project located at the Placer County Government Center and authorized additional change order authority in the amount of $210,000. The new facility broke ground in the spring of 2022 and is projected for uh, staff move-in in late 2023 and for projected completion in early 2024. Since starting the construction of the new HHS project and while performing uh, site construction, Turner has encountered several um, unforeseen site conditions not anticipated in their contract. The following issues have resulted in a need to authorize the change order to Turner's contract to, that exceeds the director's uh, current change order authority of 210,000. Some of those items that they have encountered include remnants of construction from the previously demolished 80-year-old uh, hospital buildings, large concrete vaults with the steam pipes running through them, undocumented PG&E and AT&T lines that have required either relocation or removal, on-site water accumulations stemming from deteriorated old water pipes that are um, included broken valves and required pumping and dewatering, and old clay pipe sewer lines that have run through the site originally were not slated to be replaced but have been deemed compromised and required replacement. To allow the HHS uh, project to continue in accordance with the construction schedule and to avoid any costly delays, it is necessary that your board authorize change order number two as well as any addi an additional 210,000 to provide for other um, potential future unseen conditions. And just for your information, change order number one was a zero uh, cost change order that just uh, modified contract wording. Uh, as requested, change order number two of $473,338 would result in an updated contract amount of $80,263,115. Staff is also requesting your board authorize the Director of Facilities Management or designee to approve the potential future change order amount of $210,000 resulting in a potential not to exceed construction contract of amount of $80,473,115. Separately, the um, 
PG, a PCGC uh, Campus One Tier One infrastructure project will provide much needed upgrades to the 80 year old water and sewer infrastructure serving the HHSC plans. Um, sorry, service, servicing the HHSC project and the plans and specs for the tier one are um, slim, planned to be brought to your board at a future date. You should see that in the next month or so. Um, so on the impact on April 23rd, 2019, the final EIR uh, for the master plan, which covered the HHSC project as well, prepared and um, compliant with the California Environmental Quality Act was certified by your board and the mitigation monitoring report program supported by and incorporated by reference in its entirety and the findings of fact and statement overriding considerations was adopted by your board. The actions before you today are consistent with the final EIR and the related approvals. Uh, the estimated total project cost of 90,480,000 is funded in the capital projects fund and budgeted each fiscal year based on the anticipated cost associated to that year. This project is also included in fiscal year 23 or 22, 23 five year capital improvements plan for facilities and the requested change order number two of $473,338 results in an increase not to exceed contract amount of $80,263,115. The total cost of the change order plus potential future change in the amount of $683,338 are within the contingencies of the project and there is no impact to the general fund. The total project cost remains the same estimated at 90480000 And I'm here if you have any questions. Great. Thank you, Genevieve. Any questions, board members? Yes, Robert. I don't have any questions, but I have to say that uh, I was out there the other day, and I normally uh, gravitate towards peace and quiet, <laughs> and there was a lot of noise. Uh, it's not quiet on the site anymore. A lot of noise from construction, and it was probably the best construction noise I ever heard. <laughs> I'll just finish. All of the reasons you delineated for these change orders make me ecstatic that we're doing this project. <laughs> yes, thank you. Supervisor Jones? Yeah, I, I have some questions um, on the, the necessity for the change orders. I know we're saying that they're unforeseen mm -hmm. issues that came up. But what's the um, remnants from uh, construction from previously demolished 80-year-old DeWitt hospital buildings? Is that something that was demolished previously or did Turner yes. demolish them? No, it was demolished previously. And typically when we demolish old buildings, we tend to cut the utilities off at the back of curb or leave stuff that's underground at times. So we tend to just demolish at the grade. And so we've ran into things that they found underground that weren't removed when those other buildings were demolished. I mean, if that's kind of a pattern of practice for how you demolish, wouldn't that be a foreseen? Well, we didn't document where those items, what was and wasn't removed when the stuff uh, okay. was demolished, unfortunately. Okay, so. and was that, is that different from the large concrete vaults? Yeah, so the concrete vaults that were left in place, those old buildings had um, steam pipes running through them and at the very end of the site just before Richardson, they had left the vault there with the pipes that ran back to uh, the main boiler. So when we previously demolished all this stuff, we kept no records of things that we shortcut, like leaving those vaults in and things like that. So I don't understand how this can now be unforeseen. We'd, we're not sharing this information with Turner? We did not have it documented on what was left in place, okay. the as builts of what was not demoed. Okay. Unfortunately, okay. so um, <laughs> we didn't even have pg and lines documented and you would think we would know where those are at okay. too. So it's and then um, the clay pipe sewer lines. I mean, was that unforeseen as well? I mean, we were not under we were not aware that they were uh, compromised. The intention was to leave them in place. And when we got um, further into it, actually working with um, utilities determined that they probably should be they they probably could have lasted a couple more years but our concern was that we would build the building and everybody would get in and then we would have to tear up the, the asphalt in three to five years because the pipes would have given out eventually so right, we just decided right. it made more sense to do it, it now yeah well it's a good plan it's a good plan 
My, my only concern, my experience from another uh, board that I served on, they were working on a renovation of a large industrial building. And the facilities director came to the board when they were seeking approval. And he put on one of the slides was a big, huge, beautiful yacht. And the name on the back of the yacht was change order. <laughs> And so they said that's one of the things we want to prevent is change. funding change order. You know what I'm saying? So I'm always going to ask questions about unforeseen. And I'm looking at the um, total cost of the contract being $80.2 million, million, and the total project cost remains estimated. So we're allowing another $2.2 million, right? What we're increasing for Turner's contract today is the four hundred and. Eighty or four hundred seventy-three thousand, right. but we still have additional contingencies in our project. Correct, up to the ninety million, but their contract is only the eighty million. Right. So the rest of it is our overhead and all the other costs associated with the construction, the permitting and mitigation fees, traffic fees, all those items. And then we do still have contingency. We just can't authorize that change once it hits two hundred and ten thousand. We have to bring it to the board. Right. So we still have money within our budget. We're just moving it from our you know contingency to the turner's contract okay okay well as long as we're watching out for those unforeseen <laughs> once once we get out of the ground which will be in the next month our risk will goes down significantly i mean the way i like to look at it is everything above ground we've paid for we know that's foreseen we know exactly what we're getting we've paid for a set of plans from turner that they that they're they you know on the hook to build but everything underground is where the unknowns are at so once we get out of the ground we should be pretty safe and we're doing a good job of documenting so that people who replace us 40 years from now will yes <laughs> <laughs> yes we are um, and if anybody wants to see the site uh, steel will start going up next month so it'll Great. start looking like a building thank you I appreciate that thank you supervisor Holmes thank you Genevieve uh, I'm not surprised that uh, these things come come up after 80 years they did things different back 80 years ago <laughs> you don't know anything about I wasn't that. around. <laughs> I'm not quite. I'm not there yet. Not quite, but no. <laughs> but I, I appreciate you bringing this forward. I can understand the, what, who knows what you'll find when you start digging up around there. So uh, anyhow, I appreciate you bringing it forward, and I look forward to I go out there. I drove by there every day on the way in and on the way home, and I can see the differences. And when you're going to start putting steel up land next week? Steel go up in the second week in September. All right. And the building is tilt up concrete, so the panels will start going up in October. Yeah, I see the concrete uh, trucks out there, so that's exciting. So, uh, yeah, let's move forward with this. So, thank you Great. for bringing it forward. Thank you. I don't see any other questions from the other board members. I would just echo some of Suzanne's concerns, especially old clay pipes. We should be planning to replace those. We have a lot of other plans for the government center and to ever think those are gonna last any longer or should even be in use today for sewer is is just not. Yeah, I can where show we're at great in, pictures if you'd wanna see them. No, I've sure. seen clay sewer pipe and it isn't used <laughs> anymore and it shouldn't be used and we shouldn't rely on it. So I would hope in the future as we look at the rest of the government center, this isn't an unforeseen situation and that we right. don't, um, that was the only one I can see where other things might have been a surprise, but to have relied on those sewer pipes and- It's thought. actually not feeding our building, but it is right. running through our site. It's running through the site and it, yeah. clay is, yeah, it obviously. Yeah. So thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? I'm not seeing any, then um, I would entertain a motion. A motion from Wygant, second from Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And, and opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. We'll move on then to item number 12, Health and Human Services, Behavioral Health Urgent Care Center Services. Hi, Amy. Good morning, uh, Chair Gustafson and members of the board. Um, Amy Ellis with the Adult System of Care. I'm here with an action item for your board's consideration to approve an agreement with North Valley Behavioral Health for Behavioral Health Urgent Care um, Center Services in the amount not to exceed $1,285,560 from September 1st, 2022 through October, August 31st, 2023, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the subject matter 
and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So Health and Human Services uh, Adult System of Care is uh, launching, as you, I, you're all well aware, the new Lotus Center that we're very excited about. Um, in order to operate that center, we needed to work with a partner for after hours and weekends. Um, and we're very, very glad that, um, that we will be partnering with North Valley Behavioral Health in this endeavor. So kind of at the last minute, they, they, they offer to help us, which is gonna be a great partnering because they have such excellent expertise around 24-7, um, very high acute clients. And we, um, as a county operator, will have so much experience related to connecting to community-based services, assessing level of care, um, all of those other parts that they do less of, right? So together, we're gonna really um, bring together an awesome team that's gonna deliver the highest level of services. So this new community service will open on September 6th. Um, and then we'll have an initial one-year pilot phase. We um, actually already, with another contract uh, you guys approved, we'll be hiring an evaluator to make sure that we are, from the beginning, uh, making sure we're developing the best program possible and achieving good results. We'll make changes to the programming um, based on that data uh, to make sure it's the best possible thing. And then um, together, we're going to operate 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And at North Valley Behavioral Health, for those who don't know, also operates our public health facility, our PUF, so right next door. So again, that partnership will be nice because some people that will come to our urgent care center will not need a higher level of care. They'll go back into the community, um, but some will. Maybe they would need to end up going into an acute uh, psychiatric care and having the same operator will facilitate an easy transition if that's a need. So um, funding for this agreement is 100% federal, state, and local funding, part of which you just heard through Mental Health Services Act funding, but also a lot of grants and donations from our healthcare partners and others. Um, there'll be no additional impacts to county general fund and um, it's all been budgeted appropriately for this and next year's budgets and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Amy. Any questions, board members? Not seeing any. Is there any public comment on this item? I'm not seeing any, so uh, we'll close public comment. I'd entertain a motion. Motion Holmes, second Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Uh, then we'll move on to Human Resources Amendments to Recruitment and Benefit Policies. Nicole, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Nicole Lopez, the Assistant Director of Human Resources. On July 23rd, your board adopted ordinances implementing the pay and benefit changes for management employees. In part, the updates responded to a highly competitive labor market affecting business sectors across the nation. There are multiple factors impacting the county's ability to recruit and retain qualified management staff in the current environment. Low unemployment rates, a reduced workforce as the baby boomer generation retires, and the great resignation stemming from the global coronavirus pandemic all contribute to fewer applicants for key positions. For these reasons, exceptionally qualified management candidates enjoy their choice of employers in today's market. Human resources receive feedback from hiring managers and department heads regarding the county's compensation package and their ability to leverage the pay and benefits to recruit and retain management staff which is the basis for the recommended adjustments to county policies in complement of the board's previous actions. Action item one introduces an ordinance to amend various sections of chapter three of the county code to include adjustments in starting leave balances for new hires. Currently, the county executive officer is authorized to approve up to 80 hours for both sick leave and vacation as starting balances for new management and confidential employees. As highly qualified managers become increasingly scarce, 
Departments frequently attempt to recruit long-tenured individuals from other public agencies. Most of these candidates have built up significant leave balances in their current employers. So therefore, they're hesitant to come over to Placer County and start their employment with limited balances. Starting balances can also be viewed as a form of signing bonus, which is typically used in the private sector. So using these, for these reasons, removing the current cap and extending the CEO's authority to determine an appropriate starting leave balance for new hires is recommended for maximum flexibility in securing key hires for critical service areas. Similarly, management leave is allocated to managerial positions in recognition of extended hours and often, who are, which is often worked by salaried employees. The annual allocation of hours is currently prorated throughout the year. And basically that proration is administratively cumbersome because we have to recalculate if someone comes mid-year, leaves mid-year, or goes out on a medical leave of absence. So we're recommending to provide the full 100 hour allocation for applicants in critical positions, um, which we think supports the strong employment offers to qualified candidates, coupled with that increased ability to offer leave balances when, when folks are coming on board. To address the potential inequity presented by a prospect of new managers hired towards the end of the year, we're recommending that the amount of management leave provided to folks hired after September 1st is 50 hours. In addition, the county offers salary protection benefits to management and confidential employees for extended medical leaves of absence. Conversely, the general and professional employees participate in the state disability insurance program, which also provides paid family leave benefits. Hiring managers report that the lack of benefits available for family leaves is a barrier in retaining and recruiting staff. In recognition of the demands on management and confidential employees, and with interest in, support, in supporting employees being healthy and having a great work-life balance, Amendments to the Salary Protection Plan are recommended. The proposed ordinance incorporates wage replacement benefits for up to eight weeks to care for a qualified family member and, and also to bond with a new baby and or a newly placed foster child or an adopted child. These benefits are consistent with the eligibility and duration of the state's paid family leave program. When related to an employee's own serious health condition, the current plan offers tiered benefits over a six month period, beginning with a 100% wage replacement and then decreasing down to 50% over that six month period. The changing benefit tiers are administratively burdensome and can be difficult for employees to understand, track, or even plan their finances. Proposed, um, the proposed amendment is a consistent benefit at 80% wage replacement throughout the entire period, no tiering. The total benefit or the total benefit value is just 4% more than it currently is today. Employees are required to integrate their leave balances with the remaining to supplement the 80% to receive full wages. The same replacement rate will apply to family-related leaves in, with, for the short, shorter eligibility period. We're also recommending the adjustment of the waiting period from 20 consecutive days down to 10 calendar or working days, which is more closely aligned with the state program as well. Also proposed for consideration are administrative cleanup items to correct typographical errors in the code and codify existing practices. Action item two introduces an uncodified an ordinance that clarifies the existing opt out feature for the county's cafeteria plan. Employees in all labor groups have the ability to obtain health insurance coverage through the county's cafeteria plan. 
In the event an employee declines coverage and provides evidence that they have minimum essential coverage through other means, the employee may opt out and receive $140 per pay period in lieu of the health insurance benefit. And uh, we have one request for consideration in the documentation on page 694 in your packet. There's an, an extra word we want to omit, which is page 694, the very last sentence on the page, the word the. It says the there. We want to strike the word the. So that concludes the information I have for you. Unless you have any questions, I'm available to answer anything you have for me. That was great. Thank you very much. And I know it's such an important time for us to be competitive in the, in the um, opportunities to recruit the best to Placer County employees, to join the rest of the best yes, team at Placer exactly. County. How's that? Any questions, board members? Not seeing any, any public comment on this item. We're not seeing any, so we'll close public comment and then I'd entertain a motion. Second. Jones and Wygant, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank, Thank you, you, Nicole. Thank you. Uh huh, yes, Jane. Thank you, Nicole, to you and to Kate and the HR team, and I just want to thank the board. As you know, we met to review recruitment and retention challenges that our county and frankly all employers are facing in late April, and the board's movement on compensation, benefits, and this policy flexibility to help us to continue to recruit the best and the brightest are much appreciated. Thank you, Jane. Okay, so we can go back now to our timed item at 1130. If that's okay with everyone, that's the Placer Vineyards Park and Recreation District. 22-23 final budget. Hi, Andy. Good morning. Uh, Andy Fisher with the Department of Parks and Open Space. Oh, and sorry. I will remind you to adjourn. Hold as, on. I'm just to there you go. <laughs> okay, we're going to adjourn as the Placer County Board of Supervisors and convene as the Placer Vineyards Park and Recreation District Board of Directors. Sorry, Andy. Now Thank you, you very start. much, Madam Chair, members of the Board of Directors of the Placer Vineyards Park and Recreation District, Andy Fisher with the Department of Parks and Open Space and uh, right now staff support to the said district. Um, the item before you today is to conduct a public hearing and adopt a resolution adopting the final budget for fiscal year 22-23 for the Placer Vineyards Park and Recreation District. This action follows uh, the action of your board on June 28th of this year, which adopted the preliminary budget uh, for this year for the district. By way of brief background, Placer Vineyards is the largest approved development in Placer County. At build out, we'll have a population of over 32,000 people. Uh, large enough, in fact, that it is designed by its specific plan and development agreement to have urban level recreation services and therefore a separate park and recreation agency to administer and and support those services that build out. That development will have 159 acres of active parks, 18 na uh, neighborhood parks, two community parks, uh, also a joint use pool, gymnasium, community center, over 700, I believe over 800 acres of open space and a 30 mile trail system, as well as 80 acres of landscape corridor along public roadways. Uh, we have begun, we have set up funding mechanisms for all of that, both for development and for services. Uh, in the form of a services CFD that collects uh, annual property taxes and two park uh, fees that are paid at the time of uh, land development or of building permit in the form of a neighborhood park fee and community park fee. Some of the uh, inventory that the district will begin taking on this year we expect will include some class one trail and some landscape corridor so as benefit to the public in West Placer in addition to the new residents of Placer Vineyards we will be adding uh, early in the development, some of that trail system, as well as the next door, uh, Riolo Vineyards has just added a section of trail that we'll be taking on within the next few weeks. Um, the people have more and more opportunity to get out on those trails and we're seeing more and more use. Uh, so all of these uh, amenities will be for the public in general, not just for Placer Vineyards. Uh, on June 28th, your board adopted a preliminary budget with balanced revenue of $267,984. The final budget before you today 
is identical to those costs. The revenue generation comes completely from the services CFD. The county is collecting park fees. We don't expect to be expending any of those this year, so there, uh, the budget does not anticipate a transfer to the district yet, uh, but it is gonna transfer some of the operating revenue from the CFD. Uh, that will pay for some of that inventory that we're taking on, maintenance of landscape corridors and class one trail, as well as the administration of the district itself. Uh, the only thing that did change from the time of the adoption of the preliminary budget is that we filled in some of the account codes that we were working on at the time. So some of the standard county accounting code is now added in there. Uh, that is why this um, process won on its own rather than with the regular county budget is because we were working on the structure of the account code. Uh, our intent is that next year this would be able to fit in with the regular county budget schedule. We wouldn't have to do it as separate items. Uh, but that's why we're here today. And so I will turn it back to your board um, for your consideration of passage of the final budget. Thank you very much, Andy. Are there any questions, board members? Okay, then we're gonna open the public hearing on this item. Are there any members of the public that would like to address the board? So we'll close the public hearing, and this, uh, I'd entertain a motion. I'll move approval of the item. Second. Gore and Wygant, this is a roll call vote. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Gustafson. Aye. And now we're going to adjourn as the Park and Rec thank District you. Board. And Andy, I just wanted to thank you again for the Martis Valley Trail opening and your great remarks there. Great job. And thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're going to move back. Let's see. We're on item 14? Oh, good. <laughs> yes. And April is here to present this item. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is April Pay. I'm a senior buyer in your procurement services division, and I'm here to request your approval of a few action items in, rel in relation to item 14A. Uh, first of all, approve an increase to the existing contract with U.S. Bank National Association for credit card fuel purchases in the amount of $150,000 for a new contract amount of $1.65 million, and that contract is effective through September 7th of 2022. The next item it, I'd like to request is approve renewal of that contract for additional year for the period of September 8th of 2022 to September 7th of 2023 in the maximum amount of $2 million. Also approve an option to renew that contract on a year-to-year -year basis for two additional one-year periods in the amount of $2 million annually authorize change orders to the, those contracts in the cumulative amount of $200,000 consistent with the Placer County procurement policy and authorize the purchasing manager to sign all of those actions. So I know that's a mouthful. Um, this program is required by the Department of Public Works Fleet Services Division as well as the Sheriff's Office and it provides um, vehicle drivers with the ability to fuel the county vehicles at multiple fuel stations throughout the county or whether wherever they might be traveling and charge it to a credit card system that is dedicated solely to fuel purchases. Uh, although we have fuel stations of our own with, throughout the county, we're not always in those areas and able to fuel at those systems. The county has been piggybacking or utilizing a cooperative contract that was competitively bid and awarded by the Sourcewell Cooperative Organization, provides great benefits to us in terms of uh, the efficiencies of cost and, and contract terms, and it also enables us to um, avoid paying federal excise, not avoid, but we're exempt from federal excise taxes, and by using the Voyager card, we're able to do that without paying the full pump price. The program also integrates well with the fleet services um, asset works, fuel, fuel and vehicle management system. So all of that data is captured as well and is, and is very, very efficient in that regard. And uh, so unfortunately, fuel costs being what they are, We've had uh, an increase in our fuel expenses and find a need to increase our current contract with U.S. Bank um, in the amount of $150,000 to pay for the current contract. And then we're asking for an increased amount for our renewal terms because um, we don't know what the fuel market's going to do. 
So with that, I'd ask your uh, approval for the actions that I previously stated, and I'm here to answer your questions. Thank you so much, April. Appreciate it. Supervisor Gore? Thank you, April. I just have a quick question, which is actually separate from the contract, but you brought it up. So other than the Auburn um, Government Center where there's a fueling station, mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing there's one in uh, North Lake Tahoe or something. Can you just, do you know? I believe there's one in Tahoe City. Tahoe um, City. Those are the only two that I personally know of. There's one there at the county garage in the Placer County Government Center, and then there are um, tanks at the Tahoe City uh, DPW yard as well. I think that's the one on Cabin Creek. Okay, great. Thank you. Just curious. So just to and, and not Thank always you. easy to get to. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this item? We're not seeing any. We'll close the public comment and then I'd ask for a motion. Second. Holmes and Gore, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? None. So we'll move on to item 15, Public Works, Alta Forestry Road Slope Stabilization Project. Hi, good Kevin. Morning. Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, good morning, Chair, members of the board. I'm Kevin Ordway with the Department of Public Works. And today we have three separate action items we're requesting your approval of for the Alta Forestry Road Slope Stabilization Project. Uh, the first item is to approve the plans and specifications for the Alta Forestry Road Slope Stabilization Project, project number PJ01002, and authorize the Director of Public Works or designee to advertise for construction bids. The second item is to authorize the Director of Public Works or designee to award and execute a construction contract for the Alta Forestry Road Slope Stabilization Project to the lowest responsible and responsive bidder upon risk management and county council con concurrence up to an amount not to exceed $2 million and to execute changes to the contract up to $112,500 consistent with public contract code section 20142 and the county procurement policy manual. The third item is to authorize the director of public works or designee to award and execute a construction management inspection and materials testing services contract for the Alta Forestry Road slope stabilization project upon risk management and county council concurrence for an amount not to exceed $200,000 and to execute changes to the contract up to $20,000 consistent with public contract code section 20142 and the county procurement policy manual. So this is another slope failure we had in the winter of 2017. Once we got everything cleaned up, we realized that the, the slide's going to keep coming. And so uh, we filed a claim with our insurance carrier through risk management. And just recently, we came to an agreement. Uh, the insurance company is going to pay for about 60% of it. And we're going to be paying for the other 40% approximately uh, with the uh, Road Maintenance and Recovery Act funds. So. Uh, once we got approval, we expedited the final design and we'd like to get construction started before winter sets in. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Kevin. Are there any questions? Not seeing any from the other board members. How long is this stretch? Is it just that entrance into just the Just the station? entrance. So that's um, a very short. Yeah, it's okay. about 250, 270 feet. Okay. Um, and of that, only about 60% of it was the slide that happened in 2017. The other had been kind of unstable for a while. And uh, with the bigger failure, it, it kind of jeopardized the property above and some PG&E facilities. So we, and potentially blocking the road to uh, Cal Fire. Yeah, so. not, not a good situation. <laughs> no, no. Great, thank you. Any public comment on this item? I'd entertain a motion to approve. Thank you, Supervisor Holmes and Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess we have one more item here. You guess, of course. Yes. I'm always excited to be up here before noon. B, Matt. So good morning, <laughs> board members. Matt Randall with Public Works Road Maintenance Division. Uh, this item is asking uh, you to approve the award of construction contract 1304 to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, All American Construction of Live Oak, California, for the construction of the uh, 2022 hot mix asphalt overlay 
and surface treatment project in the amount of $3,095,546 and authorize the chair to execute the contract. We're also asking you to authorize the director of public works or designee to execute changes to the contract up to 167,277 consistent with public contract code section 20142 in the county procurement policy manual. So this is our annual uh, overland surface treatment project that we perform in road maintenance. The project consists of overlaying various uh, and surface treating various roads all over the county, including roads in Tahoe and the West Slope. Um, and the list actually is included as attachment A, if you're curious about the specifics of the roads. So Public Works also worked with procurement services to solicit bids for this contract, and we received three bids. Uh, and we received no bid protests, and All American Construction was the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. Uh, one thing to note too, the project is funded with uh, our road maintenance, our SB1 road maintenance and rehabilitation account funds. And if approved, this work would begin immediately and be performed in September and October. The idea would be to get it done uh, before winter. So with that, happy to answer any questions. Any questions, board members? Any public comment on this item? I'd entertain a motion. I do have questions. Oh, yes, yes okay. I'm sorry, Pushed Supervisor late Jones. Late. <laughs> so I'm just curious, how did you guys come up with the list of, of where what you're going to fix? Well, there, there are several parameters, but mostly we're looking at road conditions. So it's worse first, and then we have uh, the different Repairs are the overlay where we're placing a few inches of asphalt on top of the road. Um, that would be the roads that would be in the worst condition, but then there's chip seals and slurry seals. Um, there's the, the treatment called a, a microsurface, which is kind of a, it's like a mini overlay. And so those would be more preventative maintenance, whereas the overlays would be more, I don't know if I'd call it repair, it just would be more of a, um, a, a stouter type of preventative maintenance. Right. Can I ask you about the first one on the list, Old Auburn Road? Yes. <laughs> have you been out there? I'm sure oh, you I, have. I drive it past needs it. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, and, and the, I guess maybe like globally, with some of these, we are looking at worse first. But we try. I mean, there's. We try to spread it around too. So that, those would be the concepts. But that one, as you know, for sure, is one that needs it. Right. Well, starting right there at uh, Sierra College and going uh, west, is that? that the main will you go all the way up to the Roseville that's right city yep line uh-huh yes and then what about on the east side of it's that roadways in pretty good shape it's in better shape and some of that so some of the jurisdiction gets tricky around there some of its city of Roseville Roseville responsibility some of it is County that's but true. yeah they're, they're unincorporated Roseville but they do get served by Roseville yeah so so um, you know, we that segment there between um, Sierra College and the Roseville city limits, that was the worst one, so we're trying right. to get that one right now. Thank you. I of, co of course. I was going to call on it <laughs> yeah. in a couple of days, but thank you so much. Sure. Matt, I had a quick question, too, on the Chamberlain's roads. There yes. are four of, or five of those. Um, I'm familiar with that area from a lot of uh, groundwater. I yes. believe that right. is cracking and then we have the freeze thaw and so you right. think that the overlay yeah is going to adequately deal with the damage on those roads because it seems like they just continue to have right. issues. Tahoe definitely has some challenges. That one we believe so. We actually called in a pavement expert too. We hired a consultant to come look at it like kind of do an over the shoulder look. You know those roads um, there in the Chamberlains there's a lot of cracking related to freeze thaw, but actually the actual subgrade is in pretty good, you know, below the road is in pretty good uh, okay. condition. So um, I, I think this was our best judgment. We tried to get somebody to check us too, to make sure it was the okay. right treatment. So I know there's some um, coordination that we're doing with North Tahoe PUD on, um, on Lodge too with some work. I mean, the idea is they're doing their utilities and we come in right afterwards right. Uh, and pave over the top. So, um, so yeah, to the best that we can, I think that's the right 
that's the right treatment there. Well, I and, appreci and I appreciate you looking for outside expertise on some of that because it's just been a perpetual problem up in that area, right. that freeze thaw, and it, for whatever reason, those particular streets yeah. seem to take it worse than. I mean, we have freeze thaw everywhere up there, but that particular subdivision has been a real problem. Yeah. Well, and, and the other thing too, just. Uh, for, we have a special mix design for the asphalt that has actually little fibers in it as well for that area. So that should provide some extra reinforcement. So we're doing everything we can. I'm um, trying to look at what other agencies are doing in cold weather too. So um, I, I feel pretty good about it. So, good. and then we'll see. So exactly. Yeah. Well, you've done that. Just, yes. Yeah. Just one other thing about that sure. section of Auburn Boulevard or old Auburn road. Um, Will you wait until after that construction is kind of done because they've been digging up the road? I know they're doing yeah. the sewer lines and all that. We're, we're coordinating that work. Okay. It's sort of the same idea with some of the utilities. We want to come in right after and pave over the top. But the work that uh, there's a couple different ways depending on the timing and when they're ready. We might do the first part from Roseville and then come back out later. We don't want to. I think the idea is you don't want to pave something and then have to dig it up, obviously. So exactly. um, but we're coordinating. coordinating coordinating that with the community development folks okay. and the developer. And not to put so, the cart before the horse, but do you know no. anything about resurfacing of Eureka Road between that's, Barton and that's, um, Wellington? Right, that's in our plans to do either next year or the year after. And I know that um, that was actually one of the roads that was high on the priority list, but San Juan Water is doing their water project. So same idea okay. where I think with the trenching and everything, the idea is we'll come in right after. Um, I think that project still, uh, I think we felt like with the construction going on, it would be better to do next year yeah. at the soonest. But it, it's definitely the, another one. Yeah, I, I, is, is a it, high priority. Part of the question was, are you going to widen it more? Are you going to widen it or uh, and? So we're looking at that. It might be a sliver widening because I think the idea is with, is it bicycles lanes, and, and that lanes. type of thing? And that's something that we're talking about. Um, haven't put together the plans and everything yet, but it's something definitely we're taking a look at and working with, I know, um, the engineering group to, to make sure that, I, I know we had heard that that was something that was, a, <laughs> that was desired, so we're gonna try to do what we can. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, for the ones that we're considering today, is there any other public comment or board questions, Supervisor Gore? Uh, no questions. Can I just, well. Yes, go ahead. Oh. I'm gonna let you do public comment. Well, there it doesn't appear there's any public, public comment. comment. Okay. <laughs> uh, then I, I um, before I go ahead and make a motion, which I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion, yeah. and then just say thank you very much, Matt, for oh. your assistance with the work at the PCGC. A oh. um, little extra work outside of your um, scope. Yeah. But it is very much appreciated. Um, you having oh. project management experience, um, so I know that we all appreciate that yeah. additional effort. So thank, thank you. Do I have a second on the motion? Okay, Supervisor Jones seconded, and all in favor? Aye. Aye, any opposed, any abstentions? Thank you very much. All right, much. thank you. So that concludes almost all of our business items. We'll come back for a one o'clock timed item, but right now we're going to go into closed session with County Council. Would you like to make the announcement? The board will now adjourn to closed session to consider four items of existing litigation uh, for the record, please note that item AC, that's the Seifers versus North Silverwood Owners Association case, is being dropped from closed session. The board will also consider two items of anticipated litigation.
Okay, we're back from closed session. County Council will give a report. The board met in closed session to consider the following. Under existing litigation, County of Placer versus Amerisource Berrigan, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. In the matter of then Cheryl Drew, the board heard a report and authorized settlement on a 5-0 vote. Again, for the record, item C was dropped from the closed session agenda. The board then heard California Clean Energy Committee and the League to Save Tahoe. The board heard a report, no action requested or taken. In the matter of the Placer DSA versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. Under anticipated litigation, in the first potential case, the board heard a report and provided direction. In the second potential case, the board heard a report, no action requested or taken. This concludes the report out of closed session. Thank you, Karen. So we will now go to our one o'clock timed item. Sorry for the delay. This is found on page 605 of our board packet. It's an appeal of Planning Commission's denial of the 3M Event Center conditional use permit. And I believe Nick is going to be presenting or? Sure, DJ? yeah, good afternoon, Chairman okay. Gustafson, members of the board, DJ Valdi with the Planning Services Division. Uh, as you mentioned, this item is the appeal of the Planning Commission's denial of the 3M Event Center conditional use permit. Uh, Nick Trefero, uh, also with Planning Services, will be presenting this item today. Good afternoon, Chair Gustafson and members of the board. I'm Nick Trefero with the Planning Services Division. The item before you today is the consideration of appeal of the Planning Commission's denial of a conditional use permit to, to allow daily rental of a former 11,000 square foot res restaurant building as an event center for indoor events, including concerts, weddings, birthdays, quinceaneras, and private meetings. The appellant is the property owner, Mr. Gus Mathiopoulos, on behalf of, behalf of Mathiopoulos 3M Family Limited Partnership. So the project site is located on the Penryn Parkway Business Park, which is located at 3129 Penryn Road, just northwest of I-80. The business park includes other commercial businesses and other commercial buildings, in addition to the former restaurant, as well as a gas station and convenience store. A paved parking area on two separate tiers provides common parking facilities for the entire property, including the former restaurant building. The property borders Penryn Road to the west, undeveloped property to the east, and property to the north is currently undergoing construction for the Penryn Townhomes project. The property is on neighborhood commercial, combining use permit and design scenic corridor. So this slide shows you uh, some photos of the project site. You can see on the top uh, two photos are the existing former restaurant building. And then on the bottom, you could see the existing parking lot, which covers the two separate tiers. And just some project background. Um, the building was constructed back in 1960 and operated as a restaurant until its closure in 2017. In April and May of 2019, the county received two business license applications from the appellant to operate as a commercial event center. On May 10th of 2019, the county sent, the letter, sent, sent letters to the appellant indicating that the license cannot be approved without prior approval of a use permit. Staff also notified the appellant over the counter that they could not operate without a use permit. About two years later, on November 18, 2021, the Sheriff's Department contacted the Planning Services Division regarding unpermitted events scheduled for November 26 and December 10, 2021. On November 22, the Planning Services Division notified the appellant that the Dream Event Center was prohibited from conducting any events without a conditional use permit. On November 23, the applicant submitted the applicant Eric Stevens, on behalf of the 3M Event Center, submitted a temporary outdoor event application, but planning informed him there is an approximate 60-day lead time for events. The first scheduled event was held despite the notifications on November 26, resulting in approximately 200 cars on the property and arrests of two individuals for illegally possessing firearms. The following month, code enforcement issued a notice of violation to prevent any further events from occurring until a conditional use permit and business license is obtained. 
On January 12th of this year, the County Council filed an order for preliminary injunction with the Placer County Superior Court. Later that month, on January 19th, the Superior Court filed a preliminary injunction prohibiting the appellant from holding any future events until trial on action or further court order. So the appellant is now seeking approval of the use permit to bring the parcel into compliance with the zoning ordinance requirements and appeal the Planning Commission's June 9th decision to deny the use permit. So in the conditional use permit application that was first submitted to the county, the appellant proposed hours of operation uh, from 6 a.m. to 1.30 a.m. daily with no time restrictions for cleanup crew after the events. Um, as far as uh, limitations on attendance, the applicant proposed a maximum of 325 persons for any given event. Um, the, as far as regards to event staffing, uh, there were no requirements uh, to include event center staffing to, to support the event center operations and to enforce limitations on attendance or hours of operation. <coughs> so before I discuss the Planning Commission hearing, I wanted to note that the project went before the Horseshoe Bar Penryn Mac as an informational item on March 22nd and as an action item on, Mar on May 24th of this year. At the March meeting, concerns were raised about past unpermitted events, law enforcement issues tied to that, um, lack of event security, late hours of operation, <coughs> and large number of attendees. At that meeting, the appellant in indicated renters would remain responsible for all operations, including event security during the rental period. At the May 24th meeting, those issues were further discussed and the MAC voted unanimously by a vote of 6-0 to 0 to recommend the Planning Commission deny the use permit. At the Planning Commission hearing, uh, the project was considered on June 9th. Um, the appellant stated his disagreement with the proposed operational controls, including staff's proposed limitations, claiming it would negatively affect his ability to operate the business. At that meeting, two public commenters voiced their opposition to the project, focusing on inconsistency of the proposed project with the community plan, compatibility with adjacent land uses, large crowds, lengthy hours of operation, and parking lot capacity and safety. <coughs> At that meeting, the Planning Commission took action by a vote six to zero to deny the conditional use permit. So an appeal was received on June 14, 2022, and the appellant asserts the following points. His understanding is that if he agreed with the terms of the Planning Services Division, he believes the conditional use permit would have been approved. He also accepts the Planning Services Division's proposed conditions. Staff's response is that even if the item, even if the terms county staff requested were accepted by the appellant, there is no degree of certainty that any operational restrictions will be followed given the past non-compliance with county restrictions. A staff, the second point I was going to make is staff sent a letter to the appellant on March 28 um, to follow up on concerns raised by the MAC members, public and chaired by staff following the March 22nd MAC meeting. Uh, staff identified operational controls in the letter as terms for the appellant to consider. Um, since the appellant never agreed to them, staff did not move forward with preparing conditions for the hearing. So the March 28 letter um, included the following operational controls for the appellant to consider. The first one is to provide staffing for any events that have over 50 attendees, with the exception of any events involving worship services at a ratio of one staff person for every 75 attendees. Second, limit attendance to a maximum of 150 attendees for any given event, rather than 325 persons uh, requested by the appellant in the original application filing. And last, uh, third, limit op hours of operation from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., rather than 6 a.m. to 1.30 a.m., as requested by the appellant in the original application filing. So, in regards to the first point, um, at the Planning Commission hearing, 
the appellant in indicated he was opposed to charging renters to provide event staffing and ultimately proposed volunteering family members, which is not really considered equivalent to hiring staffing with event management experience. On the second point, um, the applicant did come back and was willing to um, have a maximum of attendance of 240 persons. And for our third point, I um, wanted to note that after the letter, staff did request, um, we did go back and ask if he could limit hours from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. with cleanup, cleanup crews allowed until 11 p.m. rather than having the 9 p.m. Uh, cutoff. Um, still, the applicant ultimately proposed a 9 a.m. to 12 a.m. daily with no time restrictions for cleanup. So staff received five comments <coughs> through email correspondence from Penryn residents and neighbors indicating opposition to the project prior to this hearing. Um, key concerns comments pointed out were uh, concerns about the November 2021 event and the law enforcement issues it created, um, holding events that are not appropriate for the neighborhood such as the November event, um, the lack of event security and no closing hours, uh, potential for inadequate illegal parking that could occur when event capacity is not monitored, uh, lack of acceptance of responsibility for what occurs during rental periods, and the potential for attracting crime that could affect both the existing homes in the area and the new Penryn townhomes development. Also comments were um, uh, regarding the property condition, um, there's unsafe fencing in the parking lot and other property hazards. So with that, staff recommends the Board of Supervisors take the following actions based on the findings of the staff report. First, deny the appeal filed by the property owner, Gus Matthews. Second, uphold the Planning Commission's June 9, 2022 decision to deny the 3M Event Center conditional use permit. And third, find the project is statutorily exempt from the environmental review pursuant to the provisions of Section 15270 of the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines and section 18.36.010G of the Placer County Environmental Review Ordinance for projects which are disapproved. With that, I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate sure. the presentation. Any questions, board members? Okay. I'm not seeing any direct questions, so is the appellant here? We'll provide you a similar amount of time to the staff presentation, about 10 minutes, I think, is what I had. Yes, uh, my name is Costantinos uh, uh, Mathiopoulos Gas, and uh, I'm the person who applied for the permit the property owner of the 3M family partnership had nothing to do with the application of the permit. Okay. As I, as I say, the 3M partnership has nothing to do with the uh, application of the use permit, okay? You can see the applicants name and address and phone number on exhibit one and exhibit two okay the application is not other three m events uh, the application is at the daily building rentals okay and the filing was made to allow rentals for weddings and quinceaneras and everything else it was not made request to allow uh, live uh, concert, okay? Let's go back to the history of the building. The building was built in 1960 and uh, operate as a restaurant, event center, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I purchased it myself in 1985. And uh, in 2001, we applied for the development permit which we finalized the permit on 2004-2005. At, at, the, at the permit, uh, 
I want we got the permit the, on uh, let me see right now what page on the page six of 14 pages that's an exhibit we have here exhibit three let me see The, 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 the permits, uh, I'm kind of, I'm sorry, I'm kind that's of, a, that's okay. <laughs> I'm not good at uh, making uh, public speeches. On the exhibit three, the permit, uh, it has uh, three parts of it. The paragraph nine says the following uses shall be permitted within the development and goes, not permitted with the development, which goes outdoor storage, drive through restaurants, truck stops, Etc. On the paragraph 10, the following uses shall be permitted within the development in addition to what currently exists. Okay? At, the, th at that point in time, the, it was a restaurant event center. Okay? So, on, uh, if you go back to, to exhibit. Let me see what exhibit. Okay, to exhibit four, you have you will find a, per, a, a permit to operate Evas Event Center slash Barons from the re, the building was been has been operated as Evas Event Center all the way up to 2017. All that time, okay. The only if you look on the bottom of the permit, it says no outdoor events. Okay? So the only restrictions that was there, the capacity of the building was available at the same time, and on, 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 on. And there was no outdoor, the, 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 no out, outdoor events, okay? This is facts, okay? Now, let me go back to Next presentation. Nick presents you, I'm gonna go back again, present you like the 3M partnership file for the uh, use permit. No, the 3M partnership did not file for the use permit. It was me personally, under the name Constantinos Mathiopoulos, okay? So, in, uh, on a, Paragraph two of his, uh, let me see if I have it here. Okay, on paragraph two of his, per, of his presentations, we have no, there's no questions to be asked, okay? On the paragraph three, Towards the end of the paragraph, it states, consider public safety issues as aspects of the commercial, industrial, and residential project design. Okay, it's a project design, as far as I understand it. Okay. The, the, she goes back to say that the restaurant was built in 1960, on and on and on, which is very correct, okay? On a paragraph four, line three, I took the liberty to line this thing. So paragraph line three, he states, the restaurant had operated in 1960 to 2017. After closure of the restaurant in 2017, the appellant became to operate the building as an event center, but without an approval condition use permit. That's not so. The, the restaurant, we did own the restaurant up to 2017, we we'll close the restaurant. What, what this thing here implies, implies that in 2017, we allowed the Evas event center permit to expire. And the very next day, we we'll come back to operate as an event center. That's not the case. Because 
for that particular time, on, till all through the 17, till the summer of 18, we have a tenor there and we took the possession back on the building on but summer 2018 with a court order. We had to go to court to evict the person and we took it back. Okay? Okay, we go back on 2000, on a paragraph five. In April, May, that's what his actual statement. On April, May 2019, the appellant submitted two business license applications. Okay? Yes, we did submit two business license applications. One business license application was submitted on uh, April 29th and recorded on the county directors on May 1, 3M Event Center. And one that was filed was filed under the wrong, uh, what do you call the, the, the wrong category. And we went back on June 3. We canceled the previous operation, okay? We have exhibits if you want to. We cancel the, the previous operation and we apply for a new license. Okay? Okay. What the department implies here, let me see what I said. Okay, she goes to say, the county review both applications and information the appellant in a letter dated May 10, 2019. Okay? Let's see right now for a second. The county claims they review the first application, which was April 30th, together with the application which was filed on June 3. Okay? The review was about 25 days before the application was filed. Now, some things I do not understand, okay? At the same time, they claim, they inform me. They review the application, so they, they review the application. Two more, two more minutes, okay? That, that'll keep you even. Okay. They review the applications and they reject it. And I didn't use permit. Okay? Somewhere along the line, they claim somewhere on the, the appellate's representatives contact fraud card staff. At least the front counter staff contact the applicant at least two times. My representatives, we have no representatives. The only representative is me and my son Alexander. There's no other representatives. Who they contact, they, they can find if they want because they have phone numbers and everything. They, they can find out who they contact, okay? But that was not me, nor my son. If you go back to the, on the, let me see. On the 3M center has two notifications, okay? One was made by, let me see right now. Kathy Timble, 
Do I have the right name right? I'm not so sure. One was made by Kathy Tibro in 6419. It says, Old Event Setter. Okay? And the other one was made from Erica Burns, okay? which she states, on 1 through 21, I went there and I talked to them regarding the everything, okay? The only thing it is, 1 through 21, it was Sunday. Thank you. And, and I've got to say a couple other things too. I need you to wrap up, sir. So I need to wrap up. Very okay. quickly. We have some, pro, some uh, okay, uh, the Penarin Mac, the Paddy Neifer. I do know Paddy Neifer from back 1990s. My, my late wife was a friend of hers, okay? And every time Paddy Neifer needs any sponsorship to appeal things, to do anything, she come to my wife and my wife sponsored her to do the things. Sometime back in 2000, there was a development going behind the little church there, 150, 200 houses, apartments, and uh, the people came and talked to us and said, we have no problem with the development. And I think right now they start doing the same development again. That's what I saw in the thing. So from that point on, Paddy and I have become my enemy. Okay? And she pours you on the well. And anybody speaks of anything there, it's a residue of me and my wife not supporting that development. Okay? I mean, not opposing the development. Okay? Now, some of the people, they said a letter, they, there was garbage on the back of the property. Yes, of course, there was gar garbage back there. Every time I turn around the community, they bring in their bedroom sets, they dump it on the back, they bring in the, when they remodel the property, they bring the, the decks, they bring the piers, they bring the concrete blocks, they bring the bricks, they bring in the mattresses, they bring in everything they bring there. And we have to dispose it for everybody, okay? Now we put cameras up, we put up cameras to see what's going on there, okay? See, this is the complaint. The, people, the community, they put their garbage there, at the same time they're complaining. Okay? And, and on, on another thing. 30 more seconds, okay? Yeah. Okay. I've extended yeah, but a couple sometime times you, here. But sometimes, uh, when you have a lot to say, when you put somebody under pressure, th things don't come out right. Anyway, anyway, the, the final thing what I say, I uh, uh, talked to you a few times, and uh, I ask him to give me the perimeters, what's going on with the event centers on the area, and he did give me the three perimeters, the, the three agricultural perimeters down there. The one of the flower farm was uh, uh, out on the agricultural area, they had capacity of 200, 240 people, and they go on until midnight, okay? I ask him if there is an, any more uh, commercial perimeters, Setters who check and see what's going on. And he told me there is, there is none. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions, please ask me. We will do that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, board members, do you have any questions? Yes, Supervisor Gore. Just a few questions. Thank you. Um, so the applicant had a restaurant business license. It was a restaurant event center up until 20... 17 when it was closed um, it got closed as a restaurant so is a separate event center a different use than uh, than the restaurant because a restaurant and an event center can be used together but in this ordinance um, they are required to have a conditional use permit for an event center correct so the zoning is uh, neighborhood commercial c1 updc uh, uh, allowed with zoning clearance is a restaurant uh, but for an event center that requires a conditional use permit that's why we're here today that's what the applicant has applied for okay so a separate use not a restaurant needs for an event center needs conditional use permit correct and 
he would have had to come to get a business license regardless because the business closed down, right? The past business closed down. Correct. So a new license would have had to have been uh, applied for when the new use was. Yep. In, okay. Yeah, in fact, he did come in uh, for a business license for an event center, as Nick had stated, uh, in April and May of 2019. And yeah, our front out office notified, you know, let him know that you need a conditional use permit. Uh, you know, and that's what started the process. Okay. So it's, it's basically two separate uses. A restaurant and an event center, two separate uses. Correct. Requires two separate things. And that was made clear previously. Yep. Okay. Any other questions, board members, or clarifications? I'm not seeing any, so we would open this up for any public comment on this item. Good afternoon. I'm Muriel Davis. <clears throat> can you hear me okay? I can. Okay. Thank you. We right. can. I'm here to ask you to deny this appeal. The Horseshoe Bar, Penn and Mac unanimous, unanimously voted to recommend the, appeal, uh, the CUP be denied, and then the Planning Commission did the same thing. Because I didn't see any comments in the, about the MAC meeting in the staff report, I made a list of things that I remember from uh, uh, the MAC meeting and the concerns of the citizens and the MAC members. Um, so one of them is um, that there are concerns that the event center operated a long time without even a permit. There were concerns that the lack of screening process and the lack of security and the lack of online staffing, which created the problem we have with the criminal thing. The applicant said that he was not concerned about security. He said that at the MAC meeting. Concerns that code enforcement would have to handle complaints, and the code enforcement already is overbooked with the complaints. The negative impacts to um, this event center would have negative impacts to neighbor, nearby businesses and residents. It says that 22 townhomes are being built right next door, and there's homes behind the um, shopping center. There were concerns about the unsafe parking areas, especially in the upper area where the poor fencing has existed for years and is dangerous. I brought a picture of it. It's just poles with a wire on the top. And there's a, a deep fall that, so if kids were walking around there, they could fall down into it. Um, an event center, this is the real critical one for me. The event center violates the Penman Parkway area of the community plan. This business is not a benefit to the community, and the community plan says that the park will, Parkway, which is that Penman Road area, will have, quote, the types of commercial activity that will meet the local residents' needs as well as visitors, unquote. And the examples that it listed were retail, grocers, walk-in restaurants, no drive through nurseries, professional offices, and things that would, uh, would not create a lot of traffic and noise. An event center is not appro appropriate for the Penman Parkway, and so I, I would appreciate if you denied the appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other members of the public who would like to address us? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Cheryl Schmidt. I'm a longtime resident of uh, Placer County, Penryn. Um, <clears throat> I'd like you to deny the uh, conditional use permit uh, for this event center. Uh, I'd like to first compliment, though, the staff report and the, the questions and comments that were made by the Planning Commission when they made their denials. Um, they were <laughs> very reflective of, of the views of the citizens at the Municipal uh, Advisory Committee meeting that I attended. Um, one of the things that really stuck out in my mind at that MAC meeting was a statement made by the applicant, and that was, it's his property and he can do with it what he wants. Um, his response to our concerns was um, to a degree hostile enough that one of the MAC meeting members told him he's not doing a very good job of selling an event center to, the, to his neighbors. Um, and that he should take some of our concerns seriously. Uh, 
it, it, it has become clear to us because of the events that have taken a place, such as operating without a permit, um, the law enforcement issues that have been there, the, the general condition of the facility that's there, um, the applicant really has disregard for the rule of law and certainly for the concerns of his community members. So um, are asking that you deny this CUP. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others who would like to address the board? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Schmidt, and uh, I'm a Penrhyn resident for a long, long time. Um, I'll start off by saying this. Um, this, this gentleman is starting a business or doing a business for a long, long time. And my hat goes off to anybody in the state of California that runs a business, you know, and, and God bless him for that. But I have a little bit of history in that area. Um, we moved here in 80 in, in the, in the, in the Penryn and uh, started uh, going to that restaurant on and off, uh, worked out at uh, that family fitness, which was there. It moved out after when COVID started across the street. And during that time, the, the people that ran that, uh, that family fitness, which is next to the massage parlor, started complaining about what they thought was human trafficking. And it was, it's, it's a massage parlor, and uh, it's got some discrepancies. The sheriff's department's been in there quite a few times back in the day and, and uh, pulled people out of there for prostitution. That's not a secret with anyone and and he admits it he says that uh, you know once he signs a contract or something he has no control of it now this just leads me to leads me to my whole point of discretion on this whole thing when he was when he talks about he will have the renters come in and they won't need any security or they'll supply their own security he's not furnishing security and when he first talked about it at the Penner and Mac, it was a 9 a.m. to a 9 a.m. And the cleaning crew, however many people that could be, it could be the partiers sticking around cleaning up. So basically, that was a 24-hour party scene, what I was looking at. So now it's shortened up to 12 or 1.30 or whatever the heck it is. I still don't know how long or how many people are going to be on a cleaning crew or whatever. If this comes down to discretion, I think that if he's to be open, he, there needs to be a forced security system going in there. Um, the, uh, the condominiums or the townhomes that are going next door, I don't think that they know what is planned for them if, they, if uh, an event center starts there. Uh, the, uh, the fact that he would run, have an event without a liquor license, serving a liquor, and without a, without a license and still have, have the whole venue going, going on, especially something like Black China that was turned down several different areas and it was accepted here and, it was, and they performed here. And um, that's, uh, I don't know if, if you ever looked at the ads or whatever for Black China. He said he didn't send out any flyers, but it was online. It was online and uh, the people, they're not, they're not locals. And as far as all the trash behind the place, um, you can go to Rio Linda, you can go to here, you can go to there. It's not necessarily Penryn people dumping his stuff there. I, I, being an old Penryn guy, I take, take exception to that. It, they could be coming from anywhere. Um, anywhere, uh, thank you very much for your time. Have a great day. Any other public comments? Okay, have one on you have Zoom. some on Zoom? I do. Judy, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Thank you, Megan. Um, good afternoon, Chair Gustafson, Supervisors. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Judy McKegg, and I'm speaking today before you as a member of your Penryn MAC. And I'm here simply to reaffirm the MAC's position on the 3M Event Center CUP application. Um, as you've already heard, this item came before us firstly in March of this year <clears throat> when we received Mr. Mathiopoulos' presentation and had robust community input. And then again in May when we unanimously recommended denial of his application. Just wanted to you to be aware that on 
Both of those occasions, Mr. Mathiopoulos showed a complete disregard of his responsibilities as a commercial property owner operator. Um, and he admitted to hosting events without permits for several years. Truthfully, the MAC has little confidence that he would abide by the conditions of use of any permit imposed upon him by your board. Um, <clears throat> in particular, the MAC took note of his disregard of the illegal event that you, that's been mentioned that was held last November. That's the one that resulted in the court ordered injunction to prevent him from hosting future events. The court date for that is scheduled for January of next year. Um, at our March meeting, when he was repeatedly asked by community members how he might resolve security concerns for future events, one of his responses was, and I quote, because it stood out to me, was not my problem, your problem. Um, the MEC also took note of staff's opinion that granting the CUP now would essentially provide an administrative remedy to the injunction and it would essentially go away. We did not believe that that would be the appropriate course of action and felt that the ruling should be allowed to proceed first before any consideration of a future CUP. And so I'm here today, like I said, to reaffirm the MAC's position. We're hoping to fix our problem with your help. And to that end, um, we ask that you please deny his appeal and uphold your planning commission's unanimous denial of his application. And with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. So we have no further comments. One last call, and we'll close the public comments and board. I'll open it up for discussion. Supervisor Holmes. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for uh, staff for your presentation and uh, the people that spoke. Uh, I've been <clears throat> involved in this ever since 2018. I attended the two MAC meetings. Um, they were interesting. I uh, had a lot of comment. Um, I actually watched the Planning Commission hearing as well. Um, the, the appellant has um, been notified that he needed a conditional use permit to open, open, open up an event center. He was denied on the May 10th because he needed a use permit to do so. Uh, notified again that planning services in November 2022 20, uh, of 2021 notified him that the event center, any, any event center is prohibitive from conducting any events. Regardless, on November 26th, it was a scheduled event held uh, resulting in up 200 cars. And uh, I, my phone rang up, I uh, was blowing up uh, from people from Benman wanting to know what was going on down there. And so there's a pattern of behavior here uh, that is, believes me to really, to believe that there is no certainty that the, app, the appellant will follow the rules that are provided. Uh, and if it was approved, I can envision many calls to the Pasco County Sheriff's Office and code enforcement for follow-up on this. So it would be my, uh, uh, my suggestion that we deny the appeal uh, from, this, from the event center. Thank you. Supervisor Jones? Yes, um, I'd like to ask staff a few questions. So um, the, the property was purchased in 1985 that was according to his documents. Is that? That's what the owner stated. Oh, okay. And then you continue. Then you continue to use it as a restaurant for how long? Do you have any idea what the question answer to those are? Um, he operated until 2017. So, uh, and the business license he was re referring to was from 2011 to through 2016. Okay, that was the business license to run the, the restaurant. For, well, it was for the restaurant uh, slash event center at the time. Oh, okay. But was it operated as a restaurant all that time, or did it cross over to events back then in 17, 18, 16, 17? My understanding is that, well, he, he had it set up to operate as event center. I'm not sure if he actually did at the time, but he had that license okay. to do that. So I know that the restaurant continued to operate for a while as the restaurant. And then when did all of a sudden everything change when, when it started to be used as for events? After 2017, it closed. 
Um, at the Planning Commission hearing, uh, he indicated that he was operating. So what happened is in um, May 2019, when he applied for the business license and didn't get approval, um, he indicated to staff that he would open in July 2019. I'm not sure ex the exact dates that he started operating events, but he did admit at the Planning Commission hearing that he was holding events uh, through 2020 and 2021 during the COVID, uh, during the pandemic period. Okay. Time. Well, <clears throat> can I can I have the appellant come up to answer some questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hold on, wait till you get to the microphone. Thank you. Let me clarify everything. I purchased the gas station, the restaurant and the middle building there on 19, uh, I, the building salon on 1985. Okay. And in 1997, I purchased the land too because to begin was on a land lease. And I purchased the land on 1997, okay? Mm -hmm. I started operating the restaurant as a restaurant banquet event center in 1985 personally, myself, okay? I operated all the way to th through 2016, beginning of 2016, okay? Uh, but we had the license, the license expired in 2017. From uh, that time, uh, we were operating as a restaurant event center, okay? As a restaurant event center all the way to 2017, and 2007, before that, we leased the, the building out. We leased the building down to another person, and he did not pay his rent, and we had to go to court to retrieve the building. We went to court, and we took possession of the building, okay, on the beginning of the summer 2018, okay? That's when we, the building came back on our possession. And at that time, uh, 2018, we started cleaning up the building to throw the, all the stuff away. And on 2019, when we first come in and we apply for the license to open as a building. And the second application was June 3, and on the building, the opening date, it was for, the, for business, it was July 1. Okay, and on July 1, uh, the department was, was a work we opened on July 1, and we have no notification. The notification which they claim on May 10th, on May 10th notif notification, we have never received it because they mail them to the wrong address. Our mailing address is 7945 King Road, and the we did not receive any mail at the, any other place. Okay, okay, so you said that your, your license to operate the restaurant slash event center expired in 2008? It was three, Evas event center slash restaurant. Okay. Slash Barons. And when did it expire? 2017. 2017. So did you go back to reapply for that license? after it expired in 2017? No, we did not. We did not apply for license because it was uh, under uh, somebody else's possession at the time. So, okay, so it was leased out to somebody else who didn't... For a short time. It, and then you took it back in 2018. 2018. So then we at took that it time, back. did you go back to renew your license that had expired previously? No, we, we want to... We tried to renew the license in 2018 under a different name. Okay. Okay. Shouldn't have any effect, should it, to apply for a license under a different name? I mean, it's the same restaurant. Fictitious name. That's a fictitious name. Okay. Okay. But under was it the same type of a license for a restaurant slash event center? Okay. When we apply for that license, they add the category as entertainment. Okay? And as soon as I find out the category was entertainment, I went back to for the license and the, the, let me see if I have a copy here. When I file, and we change it back to restaurant uh, event center, okay?
We can give it to our clerk of our board. Thank you. Well, I, have, I think we have copies of those, but those don't make any sense to me, so that's why I'm asking questions. So you took the building back in 2018, and then did yes. you reapply to, to renew that license? The, the, we the license applied for the license in 2019, April. And was it the similar license to the one that had expired? Or did you change the... the you changed the fictitious name. We tried to get the same license, but we did change the fictitious name. Okay, but did you change the use? It, I, could, I might be able to help okay. with this. So um, there was a use on the property that was a restaurant and an event center until 2017. In 2014, the county passed the event center ordinance, which required that then event centers needed a use permit. Okay. So he was a valid non-conforming use from 2014 to 2017. In 2017, once his use stopped, um, and that use stopped for a continuous period of a year, he lost that valid non-conforming use allotment. So then when he came back in for a use as an event center, he then needed to obtain a use permit, which is what he was directed in 2019. Okay. So when he came to apply, you guys rec you told him that he had to apply for the use permit. Did he then apply for the use permit? No. Okay, I think there may be a misunderstanding that because you left it unused for that year, you now come under the new, the new uh, ordinance or code that says you're required to have a use permit in order to have that type of activity. I did, Not, apply, for, I did apply for a use permit on uh, November uh, last year. November 29, soon as, soon as, I, soon as they notified me. As soon as they so, notify me, I come in and apply right. for a use permit. Right. Yeah, well, at, at the time, a use permit was that. And when he came in for a business license in 2019, he was notified that a use permit would be required for an event center. I never and got at, this notification. And when at that time, yeah, he did not file for a conditional use permit. We're here today because he did file late last year, and that's what is under consideration of your board right now. Okay. Uh, so that's... The item of discussion. So he has applied for the special use permit now with the biz with the business. The license. conditional use permit is okay. what's on appeal before you as we speak. Okay, so the this conditional use permit has never been granted since the application, since he applied. The planning commission denied the conditional okay. use permit. That's the in one June. we're talking about right now. Yep. Okay. Um, so the big problem is there was no agreement as to what you were willing to the conditional use permit required conditions to your using this. And the conditions are stringent for the very reason that the activities, the events that you that you sponsored there led to allowing criminals attended, the sheriffs, uh, deputy sheriffs Welcome arrested. Welcome to America. I, yes, but that's why we have rules. You we know, have rules to protect our citizens. We are on the highway there. On the past 40 years which I've been there, I've seen murderers, I've seen politicians, I've seen crooks, I've seen everything come through Sir, there. You've had I've seen the FBI right. raid okay. the people to pick up the... Sir, you've had an opportunity yeah, that, to present no, your I, case, I understand. and this is not a debate. Is there, are there other questions for yeah. him? Um, no, I mean, I have clarification. So the, the stringent requirements for the conditions are for the purposes of safeguarding our community, that's why we have to have them. And so, and that's why the Planning Commission denied. No. Are there any other questions for the applicant while he's here? Okay, then you can sit down, sir. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, board members? Um, then, yes, Supervisor Gore. So I, I appreciate your question, questioning because this could have been a very good use at that location. Um, the frustration, as I see it, is that because we're having to grant a special use for it, concerns about traffic and safety, the hours of operation, uh, capacity, those are concerns of the neighbors and of the community. So the intent was to limit some of those so that it would be a safe venue, we'd have security, et cetera. Your location is a reasonable location for indoor events, similar to a restaurant, if there are limited hours, if there's security, like almost every event center I'm aware of has security. 
The problem was is that there was no willingness on the applicant's part to agree to those conditions. And I think that those conditions are really necessary for, for a use like this um, because of the concern of noise, security, et cetera. Um, so I just want to clarify that because um, the problem is there was no agreement to the conditions. And so therefore the Planning Commission denied it. And so I understand right. that position. And even if, uh, and I guess my follow up to that would be even here if the applicant says, oh yes, now I'll comply. We already are, we're acting on the denial by the Planning Commission of the existing application, correct? So the applicant would need to reapply with a different permit? You don't necessarily need to reapply. This is before your board and you could change things. Okay. Staff did, is bringing forward the Planning Commission recommendation, but staff is also making an independent determination that they don't believe the applicant can comply with these requirements either. Okay. Um, and following up on, on Bonnie's comments, oh, Jim, did you want to go ahead? Uh, following up on Bonnie's comments, if a future property owner at this location, because I agree, here's the site with access from the highway, very visible, away, f you know. Less, less traffic impacts. Right, right, less traffic impacts. We're not going back out deep into a residential or agricultural area for this um, purpose. It might be suitable, but we would have to have trust that our processes we're going to be taken seriously the applications were going to be filed appropriately and then people would follow those protocols that's why it's a conditional use permit correct, correct. I mean it's not an entitled use right. at that right. site you must follow those those criteria okay Jim I'm sorry Get you off. well I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion if, if unless ready. there's other discussion okay Okay, I move that we deny the appeal filed, filed by the property owner, Gus Mathiopoulos, to uphold the Planning Commission's June 9th. Can you tell, let's take it one at a time. Oh, okay, one at a time. Okay. Uh, item number one, deny the appeal filed by the property owner, Gus, Gus Mathiopoulos. And do I have a, a second from Supervisor Wygant? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Item two, uphold the Planning Commission's June 9th, 2022 decision to deny the 3M event center conditional use permit. Second. Motion by Holmes, second by Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Number three, find that the project is statutorily exempt from environmental review pursuant to provisions of section 15270 of the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines and section 18.36.010 of the Placer County Environmental Review Ordinance. Motion by Holmes, second by Wygant. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. May, may I make a comment? Yes. This, this was really frustrating to me because I appreciate business owners. I appreciate people wanting to invest um, and provide a service to a community. I mean, we we want to see good businesses in our community. And sir, I appreciate the fact that you've invested um, uh, in a business in our community. The frustrating part was that we have processes and procedures, um, ordinances to protect public safety and community interests. And because we couldn't, because there wasn't a willingness to comply, that's where we got to today. And so I'm, I'm frustrated because I wish it didn't have to be this response, to be honest. I, I want to see businesses be successful, but we have to work together. And this isn't a response, this is just my comments to you. No, uh, we are, we're finished with the hearing, sir. No, we're done. We're finished no, with sir, the hearing, we're, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, again, my sir, name is Mr. Sir, you're out of order. I'm sorry. We've already heard you, and I extended your time. Sir, have we turned off the mic? Okay, we're adjourning the meeting. Thank you very much. We stand adjourned.